on Superstation TBS. This year, they threw a million-dollar championship bonus into the Winston Cup stock car pot, and the pot boiled over. On track, the drivers are beating each other up. In the garage, they push each other around. Cash leads to confrontation. Hey, if you're man enough to stick a fender in front of me, I'm man enough to try and knock it off. And all this was on the big track, where the code of the road calls for a little courtesy. There is no such custom on the short track. This is Richmond, Virginia, where the gloves are supposed to come off, where fender bashing is a time-honored tradition, where we're about to see just how far these guys will go to win a million bucks. The Pontiac Excitement 400 is brought to you by Pontiac, America's road car company. We build excitement. And by Coors, the first draft beer in bottles and cans. Coors, the original. And by Purolator, the first name in filters. For pure oil now and pure oil later, it's Purolator. And by Kawasaki, the good times company. And by Warren Industry, when the going gets tough, Warren keeps you going. Hello, everyone, and happy Easter from the STP Pit Communications Center at Richmond International Raceway. Easter, supposed to be the last break for the Winston Cup drivers before that weekly chase for the Million Dollar Championship. But a month ago, this place was covered in snow, and as a result, this race had to be pushed back to the holiday. Thus, the drivers went to church on Pitt Road this morning. The fans worshipped before a temporary altar outside of the fairgrounds exhibition hall. Those fans are now gathered in 70-degree temperatures and sunshine all around a new 7 tenths mile track. It's shaped like a D, but it's very much a question mark. Only one race old. Crews don't have it figured out. Drivers don't have it figured out. They may revert to short track rule number one. If you can't drive around the guy in front of you, bump him out of the way. On pit road, the crews are concerned about safety. They remember that big and terrifying fire last week in Atlanta. For the drivers, the fear is the end of the pit wall itself. It butts out toward the end of the racetrack at turn four, and they think it is a disaster just waiting to happen. In terms of the drivers, well, let's talk about Daryl Waltrip. He says he'll get the golden egg at the end of this 400-lap Easter egg hunt. Daryl makes predictions like that all the time. This year, he's making them come true. Two wins and four starts. Up here, I think the real story. Jeff Bodine and Rusty Wallace. Jeff ran over Wallace here last September and arguably cost Rusty the Winston Cup championship. They're side by side at the head of the grid. Let's start our coverage right there with the editor-publisher of National Speedport News, Chris Economaki. Stock car racing from its very beginnings has been a southern sport. Its contestants and its stars have come from the southeastern quadrant of the United States. Not so anymore. More than half the drivers in today's field are from outside that sector, and the man on the pole is from Chemung, New York, Jeff Bodine. Jeff, how do you feel about excelling in so southern a sport? Well, we're proud of that. Uh, it was hard to, to get here being from the north. The exposure up in the northern modifies. It wasn't really doing me any good to get a ride in the Winston Cup, but we moved south and got the exposure in the Bush Grand Air. So we're proud of that fact, and happy Easter, everybody out there. Okay, thank you very much. He won the pole by 48 one-thousandths of a second over Rusty Wallace to show how close the competition is. And for more on that, let's go down to the other end of the lineup and my colleague, Mike Joy. Thank you, Chris. The track record holder, pole sitter, and almost runaway race winner in September, Davey Allison, is starting in the last row on a provisional spot. You've gone from the penthouse to the poorhouse here at Richmond. Tell us about your weekend. Well, Mike, we started off kind of bad off the truck, and with practice and qualifying being all crammed in one day, we just didn't have enough time to sort things out. And, you know, we're, we're working hard on our Texaco Havilland Star Racing team to, to sort things out. It's a long race, 400 laps. We're going to make some adjustments during the race, and hopefully we'll get this thing sorted out. But today's Easter Sunday. We'd like to wish everybody out there a happy Easter. Okay, that's the story from Pit Lane. Let's go high atop the Richmond Raceway to Ken Squire. 
Well, thank you, Mike. Seven tenths of the second separates the field here at Richmond. The big names in stock car racing, but the biggest name of them all is not in this field. Richard Petty, who has started 513 straight races, won here at Richmond 13 times, is not on the field. His time so slow that he did not make it among the provisional starters. And so it was a pensive Richard Petty late yesterday afternoon who elected not to buy a ride, but instead to go home to Level Cross, North Carolina. It was just one year ago here at this track that our analyst Johnny Hayes was saying that in this form of racing, with the kind of sponsorship dollars now involved, it wouldn't be long before even the big names would be challenged not only for the win, but just to make the field. And here, one year later, it's happened. Well, Ken, first of all, it's a sad day in motorsports for both the fans and the competitors that Richard Petty will not be in this event. Uh, it's sort of like Arnold Palmer not making the Masters. Uh, but I think it's something they're all going to have to learn to live with because it's competitive out there, and there's about 40 good race cars, and there are only 36 spots today. Well, it is the end of an era. It was Lee Petty who won the first Winston Cup race here at R Richmond, Virginia. Kyle Petty also did not make this starting field. Chris Economaki talked with Richard Petty. We'll be getting to that interview later, and we'll be back with the starting lineup for the Pontiac 400 in a moment. Six cars about to pull out in search of a $429,000 Easter egg here on the three-quarter mile Richmond International Raceway. And the starting lineup for today will look like this. On the front row, he's had two second places here, Jeff Bodine. One of the Hendrick cars alongside him is Rusty Wallace of St. Louis, Missouri. In row number two today, Mark Martin is there from Batesville, Arkansas and Alan Kowicki, who was a former pole sitter for this event. Going to row number three for today's competition. And there you find from Bartow, Florida, Rick Wilson, and alongside the 85 and the 1987 champion, Dale Earnhardt. In row four for this afternoon's competition, Ken Schrader is there, the guy who nearly tore everything up at Daytona this year, and Sterling Marlin out of Columbia, Tennessee. In row five is Bill Elliott, 1987 winner of this race, and Butch Miller of Coopersville, Michigan, ASA champion, has done very well, qualified 10. In row six, it's Darrell Waltrip, twice a winner this year in 80 and 81. He recorded victories at Richmond. Alongside is Larry Pearson, son of the great David Pearson out of Spartanburg, South Carolina. And the remainder of the field for this $400,000 shakeout. It's Brett Bodine and Dick Trickle starting in row seven. For row eight today is Ernie Urban and Rick Mass, who did such a dandy job down at Daytona earlier. Then in row nine from Spokane, Washington, Chad Little. And alongside is Ricky Rudd, the 84 winner of this race. In row 10 will be Terry Labonte and Phil Parsons, who carries one of our onboard cameras. Row 11 is Rodney Combs, and with him comes Michael Waltrip in that row 11. Row number 12 from Mississippi, Lake Speed, and from San Antonio, Texas, Eddie Beerschwale. Going to row 13 today, there you find number 40. There's Ben Hess's car and Harry Gant, the bandit out of Taylorsville, North Carolina. In row 14 from Mattituck, New York, Greg Sachs is there and the Buddy Baker, number 88. And the 1988 winner, defender of this crown, Neil Bonnet, now driving for the Wood Brothers. Going to row 15 this afternoon, there you find Bobby Hillen from Midland, Texas, and Morgan Shepard out of Conover, North Carolina, number 75. In row 16 from Spanaway, Washington, car number 68, Derek Cope. And beside him comes Dale Jarrett, who was in a whale of a battle just last night in Hickory, North Carolina. In row 17 from Wisconsin comes Jim Sauter. And alongside is rookie from Glencoe, Alabama, number 48, Mickey Gibbs. Row 18, completing the field, Davey Allison. One here on this new track last September, and beside him a twice winner here, Dave Marcus of Wausau, Wisconsin, and the field begins to roll. They're headed down pit road now, front of the field moving out, 
and car number 55 has the hood up. That car was involved in an incident late yesterday in practice. They've gone to a second car, and they're still having trouble. He'll be on the rear of the field, and I believe also moving to the back. We understood the Wood Brothers might bring the 21 car back on the tail because of a tire change. Still working on Phil Parsons' car. Now our second onboard camera is in the Folgers' car, and that is starting today with Ken Schrader. There you see the Exxon Superflow camera. And Schrader has qualified up in the seventh position as we get set for a go. The course over which they're running is three quarters of a mile around this brand new facility. There is that Folgers car, number 25. Three quarters of a mile, and you really have to hit it right or you can be in big trouble. You have to get into turn number one absolutely letter perfect, or you lose time all the way around. And then up in turn number four, it's a single lane there. And with as much action, 36 cars on this three-quarter mile bullpen, it can get real interesting. Well, the thing I'm looking forward to, Ken, is the start. As we said earlier, we have Rusty and Jeff side by side. Alan Kowicki right behind there. And then we have Dale Earnhardt. And uh, I know these fellas are going to try to get in that lower groove early because if you get caught up high, a lot of cars have spun here in practice. Nine Pontiacs, eight Fords, seven Chevrolets, seven Oldsmobiles, and five Buicks settling down to go. On the pole at 120 miles per hour, Jeff Bodine. They're still having trouble on Parsons, car number 55. See the crowd automobile down. They pulled it back, and they continue to work on Phil's machine. A tough break for Phil Parsons, who hasn't had much luck at all this season. And for Richard Petty, perhaps one of the hardest days of his racing career. Watching today in level cross with the grandchildren. More on that story later today as we watch in the back straight away, preparing for a start. Bodine bringing the field down. He and Rusty Wallace in that altercation a year ago that some say cost Wallace the championship. To Chris Economic. Well, we're here by Phil Parsons' car. Phil, they're working on his hood, under the hood. Phil, what's the trouble? What's wrong with it? The secondaries are hanging in a carburetor, Chris. Uh, it's the same carburetor we ran yesterday, and it didn't happen. It just Something just jumped up and bit us, so uh, we're bringing another backup carburetor and try to get it on as quick as we can. How long will that take? Shouldn't take too long, but we may miss the start of the race. Okay, there it is from Phil Parsons, an anxious man, back to the booth. And there is one more lap before they're going to turn them loose. Pace car bringing the field down by, and in one more lap, they'll send them on their way. We have an onboard camera in the pace car. And some of the action as they pick these cars up around the track. Pontiac Excitement 400, brand new facility, first tried out in September a year ago, and we had a great race here. It is a combination of a short track and a long track. It has uh, as much circle to it as anything they run on, as much as Atlanta. You know, there's so much about always being a point in Atlanta. It's more so here. It's a perfect racetrack to watch a race. It's small enough that you can see the cars clearly, but it's also large enough to get real fast racing, real competitive racing. 21 cars on Goodyear today and 15 shot with Hoosier rubber as we prepare for the start. Pace car getting ready to drop off this time by and they'll turn them loose for 300 miles. 400 laps, three quarter mile track, $425,000 at stake. I think on the start now, watch these cars. Everybody's going to try to stay low and the people up top are going to have to get down. From the Pontiac Pace car, looking back at Wallace on the outside, and they're going to take one more lap. They are taking another lap. A bit unusual here at the start. Bringing the field by. They had the light off. Let's see if it goes off again this time. Came back on again for a moment. I think, Johnny Hayes, you may have touched on the story that is really going to be the issue, not just at the start of this race, but all day long, and that is the racing line. Yeah, they're going to try to dive down low early because that's the fast way around the racetrack. But every year we've come to Richmond, we've talked about how the groove will creep up on this racetrack and how the track will change during the course of the day. It's a new track, and it's very green here because they haven't run very much on it. Doesn't that actually, Johnny, accentuate that tendency? Doesn't it make it even more of a guessing game today than we've seen in the past? Sure, I think everybody here was confused a little bit from on tires where the line are, where the lines are to run the car. So I think it's going to be you're going to have to adjust your car. The 25 car just stopped on the back stretch with Kenny Schrader. It just rolled to a stop. He's he's coming back up. I guess the reason they probably are readjusting people. Phil Parsons is going out on the racetrack. 
Bill Parsons now pulling back out. Here he is in car number 55. And Schrader did just pull back into position, so uh, something happened with his car. I'll say Bill Parsons dodged the bullet there because if uh, they dropped that thing, he would have been down a couple laps before trying to get to go. I doubt it. Uh, they, uh, they're taking several laps and maybe even warm the motors up good. Everybody give a chance. It's one to go. I see the signal this time from Harold Kinder in the flag. Stand. And Parsons makes it. He does not go a, a lap down. Not a lap down if he gets set to turn. Beautiful day here. Temperature in the mid-70s. You couldn't have a better race day. And there is a mammoth congregation gathered in Richmond, Virginia. For what has been the second race of the year now it's back into the fourth of the season here's mike joy can the steering wheels on these cars detach they're splined on the steering shaft and they pull off they're retained with a collar and a pin the reason ken schrader stopped was the way that wheel was indexed the way the steering wheels folks were facing were not to his liking so he stopped pulled the wheel off moved it over a tooth or two put it back on and tightened it up nascar thought he might have had a serious problem so they said well let's go one more lap the traders back up and in line everything's okay with this car Remember the year that A.J. forgot to put the pin in down at Daytona, about 190 miles an hour, had the wheel come off in his hand? He's too strong if he could put that steering wheel where they call him. Here comes the pace car in. Field settles down for a start. The Pontiac Excitement 400, about to get just as exciting as anything in motorsport. This one never fails to deliver a great event. Start. Bodine for the point and dropping inside Wallace into second. Martin stays third. Alan Kowicki in the fourth, back in fifth. Here's Earnhardt. 84 car got up high. You can see how important everyone just jumped as low as fast as they could. We cannot get hung out on this race track. One lap down as Bodine leads lap number one. Dick Trickle driving the 84 car today. White ASA champion had such a great run in Atlanta, Georgia, just a week ago. Have lost motor going into uh, turn one. Right the back Sauter. of the field. Sauter has blown an engine and spins down into turn number one. The Wisconsin driver in the Slender U car, Jim Sauter. Big belch of flame from beneath the car, and we are under caution. Got a couple of laps in under green. And running back on the tail end of the pack, Sauter has it explode. He goes all the way around 360. Let's look at it again. Bill Parsons right behind him. You can see his car shake. And then Davey Allison dropped back to go around also. the end of the day for Sauter, who finished 10th with Rockingham with a very good effort, did not make the Daytona 500 field, and crashed at Atlanta, having big problems here this afternoon. We'll be back with more from Richmond Live in a moment. We're live in Richmond with nearly a half million dollars on the line, and the race only a couple laps old when the first yellow of the day has flown. A million dollars up for the championship and all sorts of money for other awards during the course of the season, including our True Value Hard Charger Award. It's my favorite because I like to see guys get on the gas, crank that wheel, and who better than Rusty Wallace, Dale Earnhardt, and Jeff Bodine to do that. Those three are separated by just 300 points in the race for the True Value money. $50,000 at the end of the year, $5,000 per race. A little later, we'll tell you how they score that, but those are the chargers we'll be keeping an eye on here today. One guy who will not charge very far today is Jim Sauter. Let's take another look at the incident here in just a couple of laps that has brought this field down. Sauter with the engine unhinging going into turn one and a fortunate break. Phil Parsons behind him dodges his second bullet of the afternoon and the defending champion. There goes Parsons by in your frame. And uh, the second uh, driver involved there was J.B. Allison, who also slipped by. Sauter is now in the garage area, and it was a short day for him. One of the ways that we keep track of the action is with our Timex Speed Track computers here at the racetrack. This is kind of a neat little gadget. You program in the race distance, the race length, 75 hundredths of a mile in this case. And uh, every time you punch up a lap, it'll automatically calculate the speed. So we're going to keep track of who turns the fastest laps of the day, and we're going to post them on the board over here where we have our True Value Hard Charger, I'm sorry, our Timex Speed Track Fast Lap of the Day award, and the name of the driver who goes up here with the fastest lap of the afternoon. He doesn't get anything. 
but all of his crew members will get their own Timex Speed Trap. We're trying to make things a little more lucrative for these guys out here, Kenley. We're just about ready to go back to action. Let's go back to outside. With six laps complete this time by and 295 miles left to battle this afternoon, Bodine on the point. He's had two second place finishes in this race. Let's go to Mike Joy. Well, as uh, Jim Sauter was just saying here in the garage, a beautiful day for a Sunday drive, but yours lasted, what, mile and a half? Well, Mike, you know, what can you say? I'm glad it happened right now than 370 laps from now. Uh, we got a beautiful day here, and the stands look to be pretty well full. And I just want to say hi to everybody back home, and we'll be back next week. Well, the oil pan on this slender Upontiac is a lot more slender than it was. It's got a huge hole uh, where a couple of rods exited right out the bottom of the engine. They're done for the day. Jim Sauter out of it today, moves on next Sunday. Yeah, Darlington's going to be a fun place. All these cars will, uh, you talk about a tough racetrack where they have a lot of one-lane racing and people getting after it. And as we talked earlier, the cars are getting so good and so competitive, and you get a breakaway. You've got two great cars sitting up front, and you can get laughed real easy. Here's Phil Parsons, and from his onboard camera in the Crown Car, you're getting an idea what he's going through. Hood is up. Button him back up again, ready to put him back into this race. And they're going to bring a, a blower out onto the track, as we understand, to blow off some of the speedy drive before they turn him loose. In fact, it is there down in turn number one. They laid so much speedy, speedy drive down. Well, I think the reason, if you don't blow that off, you said earlier, that's the most important turn. And then if you put all this stuff on it, you're sliding and have that much more of a chance of having a wreck. And the reason that it's so important is these are 14 degree banks on each end of the course and Chris Economaki was mentioning earlier that the drivers treat turn one as if it was almost a flat corner and they think that the uh, third and fourth uh, corners are, are actually banked more than 14 degrees. That's the sense you get out of this D-shaped track. We are in the D portion here directly in the start finish line. It's a it's straight down the back straightaway. And uh, here's Ken Schrader with our Exxon Superflow camera. Good thing that we put our cameras in all the cars with the bugs today. I'm not sure what that's about. Kenny's really wasn't a bug. It's just an adjustment of the steering wheel that he was able to make. But the other camera car, Phil Parsons, what a story he's been. I got to think that the gods of racing are smiling on him today. I mean, the carburetor goes bad with two pace laps to go before the start of the race. The way things have fallen, they not only got to fix the carburetor, replace it, in fact, but now they're getting to adjust it. He came in a lap ago, and they were able to make an adjustment that they figured they would need at some point during the day. Also, under yellow, when all this is done, he's going to be right back where he was at the start of the race with a healthy car and ready to go. Could have been a disaster. Instead, it's a delight for Phil Parsons end up one spot as Sauter is retiring from the race. He's picked up one position here. They battle for every point they can get. Coming down by Schrader, carrying the second onboard camera, is now in seventh position. Bodine on the point, Wallace in second, Martin third, Kowicki fourth, and by Kowicki fourth, uh, Dale Earnhardt fifth, and Rick Wilson sixth. Schrader seventh, Thurley Marlin eighth, Bill Elliott ninth, Waltrip is back in tenth on the break, with Brett Bodine eleventh, Larry Pearson is twelfth, and Ernie Irvine, who hasn't had much luck here, he's 13th. I mean, he's had some luck because he's in the race, but he tore up one car completely, and they just loaded that one back on the hauler to take home. Easter Sunday, and it's celebrated here at the Richmond International Raceway this morning at 8 o'clock. The services uh, over here in the uh, fairgrounds area. Pace car bringing them by. And then Steve and his family the 11.30 service for drivers this morning. And there are things that are very similar about Christianity that are similar with a lot of the other religions of the world. There's a great prophet involved in Christianity named Jesus Christ who for the Reverend Bill Bear who each Sunday morning preaches for the stock car crowd down in the garage area, often time with the sounds of engines in the background, having his Easter service here, very important to these drivers. They were the ones that demanded it years ago, and they've continued this tradition through the years to today, as it's important to so many folks, important to these drivers. Ken, I think you make a good point, and that is that the fans and the drivers did take the time today to honor Easter. NASCAR has never run a race on Easter Sunday. 
they are reluctant to do that for the obvious reason. Likewise, they do not race on Mother's Day. They feel that there are plenty of racing Sundays in the year and that a couple of days need to be reserved to be at home with the family. But from the looks of this crowd, I would think they might need to reconsider the policy because this place is jammed. They've doubled the capacity of the Fairgrounds Raceway here. 60,000 folks are here to watch. They went to church in the morning. They came to race in the afternoon. Maybe we've got another race day open to us on the schedule. And the crowd is coming in late, David, uh, playing to what you just said. They have taken a few moments to spend with the church of their choice, their denomination, and now they're still flocking in here this afternoon as we speak to you live from Richmond, Virginia for the running of the county at the Titan 400. We've had the caution out now for eight laps, but they're just about set. Turn them loose to Podine on the point, coming down. Green flag is extended, and we're racing again in Richmond. And the quick move, as you see the start, is Earnhardt, who goes right up to the outside and tries Kowicki, and Kowicki cuts him off in turn one. Away and racing back straight away. Bodine in front, Wallace in second, and Mark Martin in third. Kowicki holding fourth. Setting the pace down. Getting those tires heated up before anybody tries to do anything too fancy out here. Dale Jarrett made a pit stop just before they came back under green, so he is on the tail end of the field now. He is running in the 34th position. 35th out back to Phil Parker. Up in front, Bodine by two car lanes. Dick Triple, who started 14th, something to miss there on one of the Savola cars. He dropped back to 27th in the early going. Triple, who actually led at Atlanta last week, going for rookie, 47 years old, and he won everything there is to win. 1,200 races on short tracks in a great career, mostly in the Midwest. Getting an opportunity here with Mike Alexander still hurting. And you can see Rusty Wallace is tight to us in the jet right here. Uh, here's where he'd like to try to make Jeff make a mistake. Drive it in too deep, slide up a little bit, get in the loose. So you can see Jeff's car quit that time. So Rusty's got to work him hard. Further back, Rick Nass is just on under 20 years and pick up the spot for 13. Here's the battle. It's on the point. And nobody doing anything dramatic here in the early going, just holding on. Looks for Wallace to try to go up in there and score the five bonus points for leading the race. As Dave Fame is pointing out at the top of the program, it's a million dollars for the Winston Cup champion, guaranteed this year. And those points, running out in front, leading the most laps, becomes more critical. Wallace has been critical of his own performance that he didn't try to lead more laps last year. Had he been a little more dominant in that category, he would have been the Winston Cup champion. You can see there's very little passing going on at this time. They hope to put more rubber down on the racetrack, build a groove up a little bit, but no one's taking any chances. No one's passing on the outside. Uh oh we had somebody into the wall on the back stretch. Looks like Lake Speed. Or is it the Pure Later car? It is the Pure Later car that has just tagged the wall up there. Derek Hocko is out. Stanaway, Washington driver, now pulls right on to pit road. You can see the number 68, Derek Copeland, he's bent up the front end. So Derek Cope's car number 68 comes down early going. Caution is out for the second time. Caution is on for the second time at Richmond, Virginia. As Derek Cope nails the wall in the back straightaway. Here we have the replay, and uh, he's just driving along, and I don't know if he hit something or got loose. It didn't like he didn't look like he had contact with another car. 17 laps complete when the incident takes place in the back straightaway. 17 laps down, 12 miles, almost 13 complete. Yeah, he definitely was by himself, and it, the car just got loose, it looked like. Maybe had a tire going down and just slammed the wall, and... Uh, but he was, he did come all around here putting a tire on it. Derek Cope, who crashed in Daytona and wrecked in Atlanta, continues to have ill fortune here at Richmond this afternoon. Looks like he's out of the race. With 19 laps complete, the green flag came back out. We're now working lap 23. It's Jeff Bodine out in front, making his seventh run here. 
in this race at Richmond, Virginia for nearly half a million dollars. In second spot is Rusty Wallace, who now looks like he's ready to turn up the competition level and take a shot at first place. Right down up against that wall in turn four. And look who's right behind Rusty Wallace. Darth Vader, Mr. Dale Earnhardt, the Intimidator, is coming after him. Is it two on one? We will follow the action. And that is why he's the role here. For Willow Monsoon doing the race with us today here. John Hayes with another role out of turn four. Bodine in front. Wallace is hanging on to him. Remember, they had this big conflict right here in turn one last time they met him this track. Well, we joke about it, uh, Johnny and Ken, but in reality, of course, driver personalities have a lot to do with this business. And Jeff Bodine's controversial personality, for whatever reason, seems to rub people the wrong way. He and Earnhardt are certainly not best of buddies. And Wallace, as he comes down onto the inside and tries the leader there, is, in fact, Dale Earnhardt's best buddy. So you got a couple of pretty good pals ready to go to work on a guy that neither one of them care too much about here. Earnhardt, who looked fearless. Think of anybody that he would have ever been afraid of in the industry. Oh, absolutely. He's seriously afraid of Teresa, but Tiny Lund, he would shake if Big Tiny was here. And he walked gingerly by Junior Johnson, as a matter of fact. And how do you know that about Tiny Lund? Because you can look at Tiny, his fingers were big as bowling pins. You know, <laughs> he would smile and say, yes, sir, to Tiny. Back straight away. Here's Dale Earnhardt, down about eight car lengths to those two leaders, trying to close in. On both Island first and Wallace in second. 27 laps complete this time by. Meanwhile, further back, Kowicki looks like he wants to take a run at Schrader. In the back of the field, Greg Sack may be pitting, slowing down, and coming on pit road with Greg Sack in the 88. Near the front three. Ken Schrader has found his way into the fifth position. Kowicki is in sixth. Running seventh, Mark Martin. Walsh is up to eighth, and Sterling Marlin had a shaky start when the green came out. He got himself sideways up and forth, gathered back up once again, and is running the night. Now we see number 11, that's Terry Labonte, who was running in 11th. Earlier, they were really racing each other hard. They were side by side, and uh, Labonte did get under Rick Mass, but that's been some good, strong racing back there. Let's keep our eye on car number 11, the junior Johnson car. He has come from 19th up to 11th. Here in the early going. Here's Rick Mass from the 56 right behind him. Travis Cobber, Mark Ronson, one of the Hal Needham team. And he is really closing ground. He is moving up in front of the 15, Brett Bodine. And here comes Kowicki inside of Slater once again in that contest taking place for the fifth position. Alan Kowicki out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. There's Slater staying on the outside, tending to his knitting. About 120 miles an hour in that section of the course. Number 75, Morgan Shepard pulls on pit road. Looked like Morgan had a tire going down, and uh, they came after him fast. But everyone having to be concerned about getting laughed. Those cars at the back have got to get going because the front cars are coming hard. The number seven car on the inside, Alan Kowicki, winner at Phoenix, Arizona last year, and on the outside, from Fenton, Missouri, Schrader, wheel to wheel, Ford against Chevrolet. In the early going, a nice struggle between a couple of real top competitors, relative new names, on the Winston Cup circuit. And it is Kowicki up a spot. <laughs> Schrader went right back after him, though, I'll tell you that. Schrader's a big car guy. He's not going to let one car going by intimidate him at all. He'll be back. I love Schrader. He hit the wall at Bristol last year. You can see the whole bottom of his car. He did not lose the position and finish the race. I mean, the boy does not lift. If it goes sideways, he just keeps going sideways. But he's, he's awesome. Phil Parsons getting it back together again and challenging Mickey Gibbs now way back in the field. He's beginning to roll after all those problems, and here you are riding with Phil down to the same straightaway. It lifts off, and this is where he has to be so tender on the throttle. Gets it gathered up and heads into that back. Now watch him come right out to the wall. Just eases right up to it, like the fourth turn of Daytona. You want to be right on it. And back here, it is a single lane around three and four. And there's that wall right down on the inside, and if you're going to run fast, You've got to run about three inches off, and if somebody tags you, you know you're going to stop real quick. Here's Waltrip on the outside in car number 17, and Sterling Marlin down in the bottom of the racetrack. 
We're watching here the uh, battle for eighth position. 94 is Sterling Marlin, who is in eighth, and Walsh is in ninth, going to the high side. Sterling Marlin with the Billy Hogan team. They're going to have some success this year. This year is over after the four just keep on coming on. They've run well all year. Kiki's baby boy, Sterling, is uh, he's hard-nosed and goes hard. You see Daryl, who is so intelligent and scary in a race car, we'll sit there and call his name five or six times. He's running seventh, tenth. We say, oh, by the way, Daryl Walker's won this race. Where was he all day? That's his style. But, uh, but Daryl tried to pass him on the outside. Knew there was no way. Back to the leaders. Front three just staying right there with 37 laps stabilized on the front three spot. Again, in fourth is Rick Wilson. This is Kowicki, sixth grader, seventh Martin, eighth, early Marlin, ninth, Darrell Waltrip, and tenth, Brett Bodine. The body is in 11th, where he's been for the last 12 laps. Then Larry Pearson runs 12th, Ricky Rudd is in 13th. Wallace at the white and green car on the inside of the man in black. Dale Earnhardt thunders through on the outside of the Richard Childress car. Earnhardt, who lives off intimidation, and it's interesting, that's what he's been teaching Wallace to do. Wallace has gotten a lot stronger and a lot more mentally up for these races. He pushes people around now. And years ago, we didn't see him do that as much. But the interesting thing what happens with Rusty Wallace and little brother Kenny, who also is part of that group. I think the interesting thing that we just saw here is that Earnhardt was able to drive around Wallace on the outside. It's supposed to be a bottom of the racetrack groove. Richard Childress told us during the caution flag that he's real happy with the tires and the setup. Remember, they came from six, the only car up front that has really passed anybody of any significance. But perhaps most importantly, if they could pass on the outside of the racetrack, Earnhardt ought to be able to go out right there and drive around Bodine as well. Well, I don't think it'll be quite that easy to go around Bodine. I think on the back stretch, you saw Rusty lift and let Dale go on by because he was holding him up, and he knew that Dale allowed to turn him sideways because he's good friends and, you know, forgive each other easy. <laughs> what about the tire situation here, Mr. Conamac? We've got enough lap down to know what the rubber situation is on these cars. Well, right now, Neil Bonnet in car number 75 is sitting with a blistered right front Uger. Awfully early to start to have tire trouble. It may be a story that he's following all race long. Back to you. Well, that has been a prediction by some that that tire would blister about 20, 25 laps into competition. If the Goodyear was a little cooler, one a little stronger. Maybe not as fast at first, but would get a lot more laps in. Dave? Well, there's a, uh, a point there, I think, that the uh, bottom of the Hoosier, here they really come up the inside now as they battle. Here is Neil Bonnet, that tire replaced and back out onto the racetrack, a team that has run the Hoosier tires a good bit during the course of the uh, of the racing. The battle is for second. It's Wallace and Earnhardt side by side. Bodine moving around a lap car up ahead. To finish the thought on the tire war, Bob Newton of Hoosier Tire Company says that is all fun. All the fear that our tires are going to blister here today is a result of last year's mentality. We did have a blistering problem a year ago when our tires were much faster than the good year. This year we're only a little bit faster and we unequivocally do not have a blistering problem. Neil Bonnet might pour it with that. Rusty Wallace is inside Dale Earnhardt again. Wallace and Earnhardt, closest of friends, deepest of enemies right now as they fight it out for second place. Earnhardt just nipping by, going into turn number one. 46 laps complete. I'll tell you something interesting is uh, they fired their best shot at Jeff, and Jeff uh, weathered it and is now pulled away, and that means Jeff Bodine's car is working well, it's balanced well. Here he's trying to pass Greg Sachs. Uh, Earnhardt, I think Rusty's just following, not going to force the issue, not use the tires up, because you could use your tires up trying too hard. Jeff had to go on the outside. 264 miles left in this competition. A long way to haul the pole this afternoon as Wallace 
settles in with third spot, looks at Earnhardt, and I, the interesting thing is here that a 12-car advantage has been built up by Bodine. Further back in the field, here's Lake Speed in the 83, Harry Gant in the 33, he fight it out back outside of the top 18. Boy, that's been a war for about the last 10 laps. Bill Parsons is just joining that thing. But Chad Little was running side by side with Harry Ginn earlier, and they've been running in a wad, and they've been exchanging a little paint. And that's one of those places things can go real easy. You see the camera shot from Phil Parsons' car, and he's trying to get around Harry Ginn on the outside. But uh, there's, they're all wadded in there, and there's the kind of places you have trouble. Quick Miller looks like he may be losing an engine as he comes down the main straightaway. A lot of smoke coming out of car number 51. No caution on the track. That's the battle back in 20th spot that you're watching. And here is the Miller, car number 51, in trouble. Easing off the pace. He stood on the pole for some time yesterday. Had a great qualifying run, but it looks like the engine is shattered in car and number 51 of Chevrolet, and he's pulling in. That could be all for Butch Miller, defending ASA champion. Coopersville, Michigan. Car is owned by the local undertaker up there. Back with the leader. And there you see that interval between first and second place. Still staying healthy. Bodine. Claw, 15 car length advantage over number three, and sandwiched in between them is the lap car of Dale Jarrett. From no name to Winston Cup household name. That's the dream of every aspiring stock car driver. For the man tied for second in the Winston Cup standing, that dream has come true. Ten years ago, Jeff Bodine emerged from his father's upstate New York short track. One more local hero, hoping to become a superstar. But Bodine made the grade. By 1986, he had one of the best rides in the business, and he took it to victory lane at Daytona. With success came controversy. Last year, his clashes with Dale Earnhardt were headline news. This year, he got off to another great start, fourth at Daytona and again at Rockingham. If he hadn't crashed last Sunday and finished 19th, he'd be leading the standing. Today, Bodine is one of NASCAR's gray beards in more ways than one. You know, I try to prepare myself every week to, to remember uh, championships. Yeah, that's why I grew this beard. This is a little reminder when it starts itching and, and sweating and getting hot out there. I say, ah, yes, championship. I just rub it and say, okay, we'll be ready. Tied for second place in the standings with Alan Kowicki, Jeff Bodine, who is leading here this afternoon in the Hendrick car. Number five. Swinging around, Dave Marcus, two-time winner of this race. Jeff Bodine, who cut his teeth up in New England in racing and out of Chemung, New York, the old Chemung Speedway, which his dad operated. Here he is putting a lap now on car number 21. Neil Bonnet's ride, the Wood Brothers. Our condolences to the Wood family today. Leonard's mother-in-law has passed away. He has started this race. We understand he's going to leave in another hour or so. Yes, yeah. he was going to try to leave right after the start of the race, and we just, everybody in racing would just like to send our sympathies to the Wood family. Mrs. Webb, the mother-in-law of Leonard Wood. Let's go to Chris Economac. Well, now, Jeff is on Hoosier. Neil Bonham just flipped to the right front Hoosier. You having any tire difficulties? No, he said the car's running well. The tires feel good. We're just a little bit on the loose side, but that's because of the track being as hot as it is. Because yesterday when we practiced, it was a lot cooler. Okay, okay there you have it from the leader's crew chief. Back to you, Ken dominating since the outset. Jeff Bodine stays in front. Earnhardt, twice winner here, hangs on to him. Again, Bodine has twice come home in second place in this event, 1985 and 1987. Earnhardt stays second, Wallace third, Kowicki fourth. Rick Wilson is in fifth, and we'll be back with more in a moment. We're live from Richmond International Raceway. Alan Kowicki just turning an impressive 23.75 lap before the uh, fifth stop. The field now under yellow for the moment for debris on the racetrack. That calculates to 113.68 miles per hour. We put Kowicki's crew in the running for a new speed track computer. About ready to get back to action. Let's go back to Ken Squire. 
Bodine will be in first, Dick Trickle in second after the pit stop. Dale Earnhardt in third. Alan Kowicki is in fourth. Darrell Waltrip fifth. Wallace sixth. Wilson seventh. Strader eighth. Brett Bodine is ninth. And Ricky Rudd stands tenth as we are in this caution period. Here at Richmond this week, Bill Elliott, whose fondness for airplanes rivals his love of stock cars, added a very special trophy to his already impressive collection. Here is Lieutenant Colonel Ron Hall of the U.S. Air Force Reserve. It's a great pleasure to be here today on behalf of the Air Force Reserve to present this very special award to Bill Elliott, the 1988 recipient of the Air Force Reserve Honorary Recruiter of the Year. This magnificent eagle was first presented in 1984 to Mr. Ted Turner and other notable names such as Morgan Brittany have received this award. It is in recognition of the time and effort spent by Mr. Elliott in support of the Air Force Reserve, but more importantly, we recognize his professionalism and dedication, and most of all, his bravery in support of the Air Force Reserve. It is these qualities that represent the men and women of the Air Force Reserve, and the men and women of the Air Force Reserve strive for in daily life, and which Bill represents so well, and it's why I present this award, which reads, to Bill Elliott, Honorary Recruiter of the Year, Air Force Reserve, 1988. It's a quite an honor, and, you know, it's something that, you know, I'll treasure the rest of my life. I guarantee you, with all the recipients that's done got it, you know, it sure does mean a lot, and I really appreciate it a lot. The driver of car number nine, Bill Elliott. 212 points out of first place, currently in 22nd position. Let's go to Mike Joy. Ken, here's what a tire looks like when it blisters. The tire overheats, so the tread separates from a carcass. This is a Goodyear tire off Chad Little's car, but there's no unanimity among pit crews here as to which brand of tire is right for their car. A little ways down the road, Dale Jarrett's team just took off the Hoosier tires on which they started the race, and they put on Goodyear. We need to point out that blistered tires sometimes are a function of the tire, but more often are a function of how that car is set up and balanced to take advantage of the tire combination on the car. It's as much the team's responsibility as it is the tire company. Let's go to Chris. I'm down here with uh, Terry Labonte's crew chief, Junior Johnson. Was your driver a bad boy, Junior? Get that black flag? Well, when he went out of the pits, he crossed the yellow line. You're supposed to stay below that yellow line. Blend in the traffic on the back set. So he just went right up on the track and out in the traffic. That's against the rules. How much did it cost you? Well, about halfway through the pack to the back end of the pack. You just got to come back in and be correct and go out like you're supposed to. Okay, then you hear what happened to Terry Labonte. Back to you, Ken. You heard the word from Junior. Didn't sound very happy with Terry Labonte. Well, I was in the driver's meeting this morning, and Dick Beatty made it perfectly clear that on all pit stops, the drivers must stay below the yellow line through turns one and two and blend in on the traffic on the back stretch. And he stressed it four or five times. Ricky Rudd's car has a problem on pit road. It's rolling to a stop. Number 26 car is being pushed along. That's and the this car you picked to win this race. Yeah, it's, it, last practice, he was the fastest car. We're going green right now. He's trying to get her started. He gets he it goes. fired up. The field is coming down. Greg Sachs was also in, 75 laps complete. He's going to get out and not get trapped a lap down, but he's got the hustle. Field comes by, they're back under green. As Bodine takes him into turn number one. With Dick Trickle now in second spot. And Ricky Rudd just barely escaped, going a lap down, as did Sachs. He's running about five, 600 feet in front of the leader, Bodine. That's Ricky Rudd. And praying they get another caution, he'll give him a chance to circulate and try to catch back up with his field. Meanwhile, from the back of the field, Terry Labonte has to really make a run now. Trickle in second. Earnhardt is in third. Kowicki in fourth. Waltrip in fifth. Wallace in sixth. Wilson seventh. Uh, Bodine is eighth. Ken Schrader comes back up to ninth. Sterling Marlin is in tenth. Mark Martin is eleventh. Rick Nash twelfth. And Davey Allison's the thirteenth after that start to hit him all the way in the tail end of the field. The one thing that makes me feel a lot better, the track is turned in now to a two-lane racetrack. You can see a lot of cars racing side by side and passing on the outside. So this is going to help us have a lot better race and maybe eliminate some of those costs. Good struggle further back in the field. Wallace trying to get sorted out. Here's uh, Rick Wilson moving around Chad Little. Wilson up into the sixth position. Wallace goes into seventh. Chad Little being shown a lap down. Let's 
at Wilson going up around Eddie Beersway. And here comes Wallace right with him. A tap on the rear bumper. Well, Ken, you can see they would not have tried that earlier. Now the cars are sticking there, so the good cars now have room to get by. Some of the cars are a little off in pace, and, uh, and again, that helps this race be a lot safer because cars can dive instead of pushing their way through. Driver's point of view here. Step down to turn one. There's Rick Mass right behind him. And of course, him out here would be the number 55 Phil Parsons car giving us these pictures in the Crown Petroleum car. You can see Phil Parsons throw his hand up to warn the back, the people in the back that something was going on. And look at Terry Labonte scooting here. Ernie Verban on the inside. Car number 11 outside of the top 20 trying to bust through traffic and get back into the thing. Ten lights. He went way to the rear. And he moves around Irvine as he continues to stretch his field out. Try to dive through. He's pulling up on Bill Elliott now in the car number 19. Elliott driving the full distance. He has a new stint for his wrist. He was out here the other day running without any assistance on that left wrist after he broke it down there at Daytona. Terry Labonte trying to close in on Elliott in the nine and on uh, number 29 as well, Dale Jarrett. And a break back into the top 20. Here's Labonte down on the inside. Dale Jarrett a tad high, and here's Labonte working his way back through. The penalties are crossing the yellow line down in turn number one. You're supposed to blend in there. That's what said he did not. I think the key about the uh, Terry Labonte car is a lot of people are not talking about Terry. You haven't heard a lot about Terry this year except you shifted the Fords and they say the Fords the problem. That is not the case. That car's run well everywhere it's raced. They've just been caught in some of these crazy situations. But talked with Tim Brewer and he feels strongly that the car is going to be very good and they're going to win races and it's just dialing it out, getting it balanced. Up in front, the leader, Bo Dine, is just flying away from the field at this point. Look at this interval between first and second place. There's Bo Dine in front. Earnhardt is now secure in second spot. Trickle is third, and Kowicki is fourth. So the black car, number three, is in second, and we have Chevrolet one and two on the field. The way Bo Dine got the big jump is... Earnhardt and Rusty Wallace were behind Dick Trickle, and he was able to get a quicker start off the line, and everything got bumped together, and they went three wide, and Jeff spread it at that time. On board. He is up to 40 knots, put out here in this race. That's Ken Schrader. Jeff eases that car yeah, down into yeah, the Yeah, he doesn't look like he's working hard at all, does he? Uh-uh. And that's the secret to it if you're going to run these endurance contests on a short track like this. Be so smooth and so careful and so deliberate <laughs> and so aggressive and downright ugly once in a while if you want to win here. Yeah, I, I think Rick Hendricks picked him a winner with Kenny Schrader, though. There were a few years ago you wouldn't have said much about Kenny Schrader except he was a good guy. But now I tell you, everywhere you go, he runs well. And He's not one of those people who says good speedway, good short track, doesn't do well, doesn't do this. Ken Trader runs well everywhere we go. Now, he's out of control sometimes, but he does well. Let's look further back. Here's the battle that's taking place for third and fourth place. There you see car number 84, Dick Trickle, the great racer out of Wisconsin Rapids, Wisconsin. And right behind him from Milwaukee comes number seven, Kowicki trying to get in this thing. Inside. That's number eight, Bobby Hillen, going a lap down. The two cars in the Cibola racing stable running nose to tail at this point. Down to the inside, moves Kowicki. Tries to draw a B. Now, this is the guy he chased for four years out in the Midwest in the ASA competition. And we're back at it again. It's going to be like old times for that team. Kowicki closing in with the four. On the Buick, number 84. Wonderful to watch Dick Trickle get an opportunity. Billy and Mickey Savola, after Mike Alexander was hurt, went to Trickle, gave him the shot, and he elected to sign up to run for Rookie of the Year. He doesn't know how long his chance is going to last, 
And the ride is Mark Alexander. Caution. We're under coming. caution. Caution back out. That's the fourth time Greg, today, and you're early going. Greg Sachs is uh, going slow down the back stretch, so uh, I don't know if he hit the wall. I can see smoke coming out of the car. And he may have done some fluid in the back straightaway, and they're not taking And immediately, Earnhardt pulls on pit road. Number three comes in in a hurry. And that was a smart move because the pace car is coming out right this second to pick up Jeff Bodine. So Dale Earnhardt elects to pit. He'll have to come firing out of the back of the field. Davey Allison also pitting. More of the action from Richmond in a moment. Under caution on the Richmond International Raceway, the old fairground circuit. Jeff Bodine electing not to pit. Dick Trickle the same. Alan Kowicki, Rusty Wallace all staying out there on the track with 94 laps complete. And you see this group up on the roof down here in turn number one, a bunch of casual viewers. No, sir. Those fellas are probably the most important people in the racetrack other than the driver. Those guys are the spotters. They are the head coaches in the box. You're just saying that because that's what you used to do. Well, I was a great spotter. I will not disagree with that. I was all pro <laughs> spotter seven years in a row. But those guys tell the drivers what to do, warn them, coach them. It's a great shot. And you see that man on the end in the uh, good ranch uniform. That's the guy that just called the shot for Earnhardt to make that pit stop when nobody else came in. They, they, he realized what was going on and got him in and got him out to get whatever they needed. Yes, and the problem was all the other spotters told their cars, okay, stay out. Now we got Earnhardt to the back. So it'll be worth the price of admission to see Earnhardt come through this group going to the front. I, 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 if, if it were me, I'd just pull over. <laughs> You think they lie to each other up there a lot? Of oh, yeah, yeah, they, they help each other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there is Dale Earnhardt, who now is out back, and he's got a few fans here today, that's for sure. It's well over 40,000 together this lovely Easter Sunday in Virginia on one of the grand old tracks of NASCAR, missing one of its greatest stars, Richard Petty, today, watching this race in the level cross after the number 43 FTP Pontiac did not qualify for this event really is missed. You think they ought to come up with a new rule where Winston Cup champions, like they do in the PGA, you know, the, the Masters and uh, the TPC and the U.S. that you win those things, you get like 10 years that you can uh, get an opportunity to, to qualify. Hey, if it were mine, I'd give Richard Petty a lifetime exemption to everything there is. There's no man in the history of the sport that what? has done more than that man. One lap and we're going to be racing. One lap and we're going to turn him loose one more time. Getting set on the start. Now let's watch Bodine on this restart and see if he can pull off to the lead like he had before because the eight car Bobby Hill and Jr. got side by side with Dick Trickle and Bodine was able to drive away before Kowicki and the other car could get to him. So let's see if he gets the big jump. Holding up for a start and that battle up in front is going to be something as Alan Kowicki by third on the field. You know, Allen has won more money in the first three races this year than he did in the entire 1986 season when he was Rookie of the Year. He's already bagged $103,000 this year. I think Allen and Bill Elliott, the only two guys that are in charge of their cars right like there. Pace car is in. The Pontiac pace car pulls off the track. Field is ready on the start. Bodine in front. Trickle is in second. Here they are on the brake. Well, let's check it out. Let's see if Bodine can jump down in front of Bobby Hill and Jr. and let Bobby run side by side with the 84 car. And he did push him up. And if, if Jeff could get these cars side by side, that helps him drive off. So Jeff is getting through the turn beautifully. Coming around to complete 98 laps as we go back under green here at the Richmond International Raceway in the Pontiac Excitement 400. Everybody settles in for just a moment to get a little heat on those tires before they get down to serious business. He was going to be the first to take a break, and Bodine pulls away again. He just flat out runs him for a while. Well, again, he has Bobby Hill and Jr., who is the last down right between himself, and it's very hard to get around these cars on these tracks unless you have that extra burst of power. You have to work them for two or three laps, and this gives Jeff a runaway. During that yellow flag period, some significant work was done in the pits. Dale Earnhardt and Rusty Wallace have both switched from Goodyear to Hoosier Tire. The leader, Jeff Bodine, started on Hoosiers, and he's still out front. Back to you. 
tell the tire changes are taking place, just like Chris said it happened earlier. Look at Bodine, whether it's uh, Earnhardt back here further away as Bodine continues to draw away Chad Little. Being challenged by the man in black, number three. And, and Earnhardt in these kind of situations does not have a lot of patience from Chad Little, who's new to the circuit and wanting to prove himself, would love to keep Earnhardt behind him. They're going around Eddie Beers well, he's using that car. But this is the kind of situation where Earnhardt is just locked into a place and he has to force the hole. Around some laps out of the field, trying to sort himself out. Here comes Earnhardt in number three, ducking inside and out, looking for any kind of running room to get back up of those leaders. Meanwhile, further back in the pack in the lead group, as Bodine pulls away, tremendous battle developing just behind this man, Bodine, for the second position. As 84, Dick Trickle finds some running room. Bodine is in there, and Wallace, there you see them fighting for second spot. Bobby Hillen is creating the shuffle out there. He is a lap down, but he is, is trying to stay with the field and get his lap back. Well, I felt like Bo Dine would get by Hillen, jump right in front of him. Then he can use Hillen as a blocker to just keep people from getting around him. You see Rusty. Now, here's another situation. Rusty's aggressive like Dale is. And how long is he going to put up with it, or is he going to try it? He drives by on the outside, but Bobby Hillen comes up underneath him and is going to race him because Bobby Hillen is going to race you hard. And 27 has the power to deal with Hillen on the outside. Here's what scooting along high side. And now about one and nine tenths of a second, the second place group behind the leader, Bodine. 103 laps are complete. Hillen tucks it down low. And Alan Kowicki has been able to get by up top. So by the racetrack, the groove moving up a little bit has helped those people. I don't think that Hillen was any too eager also to have the car with the same racing colors, the same racing livery trickle going by him like that. He was really trying to show that he could handle that car and stay up in there. Well, I think any race car driver, whether he's down a lap or not, feels like he's going to get it back. And he's going to race him just as hard as he can every lap. If he doesn't, you don't want him driving your race car. So I think Bobby Hillen's doing just what he needs to do. Wallace second for Wiki third, trickle fourth, and Rick Wilson fifth. Darrell Waltrip line sixth on the field. Seventh is Sterling Marlin. Eighth is Earnhardt. Ninth is Parsons. Tenth is Bodine. Eleventh is Lake Speed. And twelfth is Kenny Schrader. You know, we haven't called Rick Wilson much, but he's driven an excellent race today. He stayed up front all day. He's there good and solid. And Darrell is making a gigantic move from eighth to sixth, but is still playing hide and seek. Here's Rusty Wallace running now about a second back from the leader, Jeff Bodine. Rusty Wallace, at the end of the 1988 season, was any indication the Winston Cup Series soon will have its first champion from the American heartland. A graduate of the Midwestern Short Track, Rusty Wallace came south with great confidence in his own ability and not a whole lot more. He didn't get a full season ride until 1984, but he rode that ride to Rookie of the Year honors. He signed on with Blue Max Racing, determined to become a contender. And while the team gained strength, Wallace learned lessons in aggressive driving from Dale Earnhardt the acknowledged master and Rusty's new best friend. Late in 88, his hard driving style paid off. He repeatedly came from a lap down to win. He took five of the last six checkered flags. Never mind that he came up short of champion Bill Elliott by the narrowest of margins. This year, Wallace figures that title all his. I really do. I feel real good about it. You know, I lost it last year by just 24 points, and I don't want that to happen again, and I'm working real hard to try to get him back. One of the great contenders, car number 27. And a big contingent of Wallace fans continues to grow. They like his style, like his personality. Well, Rusty's running Jeff Bodine down, down now. You can see uh, the gap is closed. And uh, I think his car's working that well. And another guy that's coming is Earnhardt. He's come all the way from the back, and he's running in about seventh place now. He's right behind Rick Wilson. Up so to sixth place now, sixth John. Sixth place, so... Uh, so he's trying to get back up there. It shows you how good his car is. It's working so well at the bottom, and he can also bash at the top. Here's Jeff Bodine again. Jeff's just driven a flawless race. The uh, car's working well. He's not going to abuse the tires. He's running up front. He has no one in front of him. Don't race real hard until you have to. You don't want to abuse those tires. 
tires may be the key story in this battle that we're watching right here because Bodine has stayed on the Hoosiers throughout and has been going through them like Buster's gang, while the guy behind him, Rusty Wallace, came off the Goodyears, which were wearing longer, to the Hoosiers, which seemed to be faster but wear out in a hurry. I don't know when Rusty made that switch if he was aware that Bodine's crew has already been off searching for more tires. They went through two sets in the first 50 laps and they figure they might run out before it's all over. So the Hoosiers appear to be faster, but they have a wear problem. I think it's significant that real Goodyear loyalists like Rusty Wallace and Dale Earnhardt would switch to Hoosier. They must think they're a bunch better. There you see that group up in front, first and second place. And further back, Earnhardt is about to wage a tremendous battle. Here's your two leaders. As Bodine and Wallace stay first, now look at this collection. The number four is Rick Wilson, and directly behind him is the number three of Earnhardt as they begin to challenge. That is for six spots. Putting a lap on Hillen, who's now come off the pace a bit. Earnhardt trying to close in on Rick Wilson in the four. Phil Parsons, they're reporting, is up to seventh after all those problems that Phil had earlier in the Crown Petroleum car. He's back in this thing again, making a very good run. Now, the other man in this group doesn't matter. It's all irrelevant. It's right here. It's on the lead. 116 laps complete, and we have a challenger on Bodine. To the outside goes Rusty Wallace. Chevrolet on the inside. Pontiac on the outside. Richmond International Raceway live on the Superstation this afternoon. Here comes Wallace. Just motoring up the outside, and he sure has that car dialed in properly. He goes into first place. He just wheeled by him. Yeah, and I'm not sure in that situation that Jeff didn't let him go by a little bit instead of abusing the car because he knows Rusty's hooked up. He's not in jeopardy of anything. And this, we have a long race. Dale Jarrett has just pitted another time. So Wicky is third. Trickle is fourth. And now Earnhardt has moved around Wick Wilson to take fifth. Wilson drops to sixth. Carson still joins seventh. But those first three cars are on Goodyear tires. I mean, are on Hoosier tires, and Trickle's on Goodyear, and then Earnhardt's coming very strong, and we'll check those tires, but Phil Parsons is on Hoosier tires also, and that's helped him run past a bunch of traffic. Here's the crew standing by, the Richard Childers team. Remember that he is holding on to fifth place. And he's within striking distance. He is down about a quarter of a lap, maybe a third of a lap, to the current leader, Rusty Wallace. But the car that is of major interest at this point, I would say, besides this number three, is the car that's just two positions back from it. And that is the 55 car of Phil Parsons, who had everything in the world go wrong. He lost the car, got in the wall yesterday, was all torn up. He had every every sign that he wasn't even going to get out here to start the race today and there you see him he is up to seventh place and he is closing on rick wilson well, well i tell you i saw phil parsons and his guys struggling trying to get that car and i was sitting there saying gosh they should have stayed home for easter man so it's amazing how your luck goes hey the way that goes you come out here and win the race today people have trouble he wins the race and you thought you were dead on the start and he was dead on the start. Had it not been for a problem created on the car number 25, the Folgers car, Schrader had a problem with his steering wheel. It took two or three laps. As he was, the car was balking and stopping in the back straightaway. That's all that saved Parsons from uh, not being around at the start, being two or three laps down now. And instead, he's very much in and ready to challenge. Here's the number three, Earnhardt in fifth. And he's looking for Dick Trickle in fourth right now. Earlier, we asked Taylor and Hart that it was more fun coming into this Richmond race, leading the point rather than being in further fourth. Well, it is. It, you know, it sort of establishes the car to beat whether you're the toughest that track or not. But I think the consistency of the team and the consistency of the whole season of winning that championship, uh, we're a little unhappy about not winning any races yet. Been close, but, uh, you know, we, we still want to win in points. A couple of thirds so far this year for Dale Earnhardt. He's still trying to collect those points. What I love about Earnhardt, everybody's sitting there saying, well, Earnhardt, he's history, right? He didn't win here. He didn't win there. He finished second, second, and third. I was sitting there saying, one time in my life I would like to own a team like that that's first in points, but everybody says, gosh, y'all not doing real good. You only finished second. 
<laughs> Here is number three, Earnhardt. Seeky, Dick Trickles, number 84, take another spot. Meanwhile, car number 48 is retiring from the race. Mickey Gibbs out of Glencoe, Alabama. It's a good struggle up in front. O'Dine pulling back up on Wallace a bit here. This is the 75 car and the 6 car Mark Martin both came down pit road. So I'm saying tires are going to end up being the story of this race. Morgan Shepard now changing left side rubber stays on pit road as the leaders come by to complete 126 laps this time at Rick Continuing coverage of the Pontiac Excitement 400 is brought to you by Wrangler, made in the USA. And by Sears, where you get your money's worth and a whole lot more. Near capacity Easter afternoon crowd watching Rusty Wallace and Jeff Bodine have at it here. And in running down Jeff Bodine to take the lead, Rusty Wallace clicked off a lap at 23.65. That's 114.16 miles an hour on my Timex speed track. Rusty Wallace may have just won a set of Timex speed tracks for his entire pit crew. But the big story right now, fire sale on tires. And for that story, let's go down to pit road and Mike Joy. Well, there's another race here, Dave, and it's the race to the Hoosier Tire Store. Blistering tires, many of these good years, and here's Darrell Waltrip's crew men. Morgan Shepherds, and all, many of the top teams are here to get those good years busted and have the Hoosier men from Lakeville, Indiana, mount up their brand of tire. Later in the race, who knows? It could swing the other way, and Wayne Torrance's Goodyear troops could get extra busy. Right now, they don't have much to do at their end of the tire store. There were more tires purchased before this race for the big teams down along pit road. You saw stacks behind the uh, pits for both Hoosier and Goodyear. And now the teams that hadn't done that are going back to the store and picking up some more rubber. Right before we cut to commercial, we had Harry Gant and Sterling Marlin racing side by side. He's on Harry's on Goodyear. He all of a sudden drops way back, had to come in and change two tires, but Harry Gant is still on Goodyear tires and is struggling with it. And he has lost one lap. He has lost a lap. Mark Martin has lost two laps, and there are the leaders. Rodney Cole coming in on pit road. Badly, it looks like he might have got sideswiped in the car 34 on pit road. Here is car number 27, Rusty Wallace, up in front. The second place man is the number five. That is Bodine. Then third, by Kowicki with four triple fifth and heart. Six, Phil Parsons in the 55. Outstanding run by Parsons after almost no luck at all as the day began. And in seventh is Rick Wilson. Eighth is Waltrip. Ninth is Marlon. Tenth is Ken Schrader. Moving to 11th is Lake Speed, 12th is Davey Allison, 13th Terry Labonte, 14th Larry Pearson, 15th is Ricky Rudd, 16th Bodine, and Ernie Irvin is in 17th. I think a point we ought to make about this tire situation, guys, is that when these guys came here yesterday with only four hours total of practice time to set up for this race, the good years were identifiably significantly faster. There was no doubt, and the field was split about 70-30 in favor of Goodyear tires. As they practiced and qualified, that situation shifted. The loyalty shifted. The stopwatches were indicating, no, oh, wait a minute. When we get out here and run on this thing for a while, the Hoosiers seem to be picking up the speed. So that's the reason that you see all this shuffling in the middle of the race. You might ask, wait a minute, why are these guys going down and buying up all these tires at mid-race? Don't they know what's going on? Well, in fact, they didn't. They were tricked. They were surprised, if you will, by the transition. Everybody, I think, was surprised except the Hoosier tire guys who said, this is what's going to happen. They were ready for the onslaught, but frankly, Richmond continues to be a mystery to these guys, and largely the key or the clue, the key clue that they're looking for in that mystery is the right tire combination. Let's go down to Chris Economy. What you're looking at is the under the hood work on Morgan Shepard's number 75. What seems to be the problem, Morgan? Well, Chris, uh, we got uh, something in mission in the Babylon Pontiac. You know, first of all, we had a flat tire. Then we had another tire problem. Uh, it just seems like the uh, Babylon Pontiac. Pontiac's been plagued with problems. Today. This car is making its first start in the Northern Hemisphere today. This car was built for a race in Australia that it won in December, and this is its first time out in the United States. It's not having good luck at all. Back to the booth. Following up on that tire story, but again, we were not with us at the outset. 21 of these cars started on Goodyear rubber. 
15 on Hoosier, and the change is now heavily to Hoosier. Since the outset of the event, Bodine, who sat on the pole, has led, and Rusty Wallace has led, and that's pretty much the story as far as the leaders are concerned. It's been the pair of them continuing their dice. They are now leading by five and six tenths of a second over the third place man, Alan Kowicki. Well, you can see now how well Phil Parsons is running. He has run down Dale Earnhardt, and uh, they're both on Hoosier tires, so that means the car's not working quite as well as Dale would like it, and that could be just some chassis adjustment that will work later. One thing about the tires, I made it perfectly clear in the driver's meeting, once you get to the final 100 laps of the race, the tire you're running at that point, you cannot change the brain. So uh, you have to make your mind up what you're going to finish the race on with 100 laps to go. Bill Parsons, car number 55. Now into the fifth position. And closing. Now he's moving for Dick Trickle. It's been a sensational run. He's got about a second and a half. He's tagging along with Bill Elliott, who's being shown one lap down to the car number nine. There's Elliott. You know, Elliott is 212 points out of the first place at the present time. There's Walcott coming out of pit road at number 17. Darrell Walcott who was running in eight pulls on the pit road. Last year, after four races, Elliott was 11th in the standings, 117 points out. Right side tires. Well, Phil Parsons drove by Dale Earnhardt and Bill Elliott. He hadn't done that probably many times in his career, so that has to be a great feeling to go by cars that good. You know, John, I still think that Elliott is going to be a major contender before this year is over to win it all. Remember when Waltrip came from 285 points back in uh, 1981? He had about uh, nine or ten races to go that year and beat out Bobby Allison for the championship. And uh, he was like 230, 240 out in 82, and, and he came back and, and won. So you can track that far back. You can go to the bank with Bill Elliott is going to be a factor. He's one of the greatest race car drivers that ever lived. He's hurt. He's playing hurt, which everybody really respects him for. But when it get, you remember last year, Rusty Wallace won six races or something in the last half of the season, and I think five in the last half of the season. I think we're going to see Bill Elliott get on his roll, but he's got to get help. As hard as the Winston Cup title is to win, it's even tougher to keep, especially when Eddie Luck turns her back on you, just as it has on the reigning champion. In 1985, Bill Elliott burst into the spotlight. 11 wins and a million-dollar bonus from Winston. But it took three more years for Bill and his family racing team to mature, to be consistent, to win the Winston Cup championship. A perennial fan favorite, Bill has long been the guy to beat on super speedway. But not until last year, this championship year, did he finally win a short track. Last month, the rich and popular champion went to Daytona to launch his title defense. Things quickly went bad. A blown tire, a bad crash, a broken wrist. Elliott needed a relief driver in the first two races and struggled to 11th place last Sunday. He's 26th in the standing and a long shot to repeat his champion. Well, I just hope I can go all the way and be as competitive as I guess I was at the end of 88. You know, with everything that happened at the first part of the year, it's hard to really put yourself up, put the position. But when I finally get back in the race car and feel like I can drive it like I'm going to drive it, then I'm going to go away. Currently running 17th, Bill Elliott. And the biggest cheer here yesterday from about 20,000 fans who turned out for qualifying was when he put the nine car on the pole briefly halfway through qualifying he turned a heck of a lap and it stayed up for a while but it was not to be as the cars ran faster the weather seemed to be in favor of those who ran later in the day leader in traffic look at this right through there is this car number 25 on the outside and the body on the inside and plowing right through the middle comes rusty wallace bodine right with him that's putting those cars down a lap that's why it's so tough he is lapping the cars in 12th and 13th position. The white and green, number 27. That's the Pontiac of Rusty Wallace, putting Kenny Schrader in the Folgers car a lap down, carrying our Exxon Superflow camera, and the car of Terry Lamotti, the Junior Johnson creation, the new third team this year. 
back up in front to review. Wallace stays first. Bodine is in second. Kowicki is third. Dick Trickle is staying a good stout fourth. And Phil Parsons, having a tremendous run, stays fifth on the field. Sixth is Dale Earnhardt. Seventh is Rick Wilson. Eighth is Davey Allison. Ninth is Ricky Rudd. And tenth is Larry Pearson. Just outside that group, Lake Speed lies 11th. And as we mentioned, uh, a lap down in quality Trader just now. And 13th is Lebanon. There's Ken Trader still at work. Rick Wilson is coming down pit road for tires. And, and let's don't forget Alan Kowicki. He's driving a super race. He's right close to the leader. He's third and is always in a spot race car driver takes in a race car. So let's don't forget Alan sitting back there. The number seven car, Kowicki, blasting through on the inside, and he's putting those metal laps down. Notice the white number 66 at Rockbridge, Jazz, Virginia. Rick Mann. Now he is running a lap down as well, but he's certainly cutting through traffic here. You notice Schrader in the number 25 car slid real good right before uh, Mass went under. We had four early cautions, but the last 100 laps have been relatively caution-free. We're showing 157 laps as now being completed on this three-quarter mile track. We've gone 117 miles with 182 to go. Leader continues to be Wallace, Bodine in second, and it has been a two-man show on this Easter Sunday, thus far at Richmond. There is but one way to win a Winston Cup short track as we watch this one live from Richmond International Raceway. That is to charge. You cannot stroke your way to victory on the short race tracks. And thus, our True Value Hard Charger standings for this race also reflect the running order up front. Bodine and Wallace are having themselves a battle for the lead. Bodine holds a narrow lead over Wallace in the Hard Charger standings. They pay five points to lead a lap, four for second, three for third, and so on down through one point for fifth. And they keep tabs on this all day. Five thousand dollars in awards up here this afternoon 50,000 for the end of the season those were the standings as we came into this event but for today Bodine has the advantage thus far and of course the bottom line is who's going to win the hard charger award at the end of the day and who's going to win the race to check on the battle let's go back topside to our man Ken Squire it continues to be a two-man fracas between Jeff Bodine and Rusty Wallace let's take a look at what happened here just moments ago as they were fighting for position Wallace had been leading over the last 50 or 60 laps. This is in replay. You see, Bodine jumped under him, and uh, Rusty's car got just a little bit loose up, going up in that upper lane, and uh, he was just able to clear him there. So that's brought around this kind of a situation. Bodine is back in front with 167 of 400 laps complete. Rusty Wallace is now in second. Kowicki is in third. Dick Trickle is in fourth. Phil Parsons is in fifth. And Parsons is the story of the moment in car number 55. Here from inside, you're riding with Phil Parsons right now. And he's trying to close in on that yellow car just in front of him. That is Dick Trickle. Here's the contest on the track. And you're with Phil Parsons. He tries to move around out here and get himself another spot. That car on the bottom right now is the Hillen car. The triple car is up about another 100 feet in front of it. So something happened to Bobby Hillen's car, and he slowed dramatically, and several cars had to get and out of He's coming into the back. pit. He's coming in. Hillen is coming in. And another circumstance to develop is Kowicki back up there in that corner, and Dick Trickle is scooted around, and Trickle is now going up for the leaders. Dick Trickle going down the back straightaway who just 10 laps ago was right in the hands of Parsons. Something happened on the seven car. It backed up, and here comes Dick Trickle. He is really hitched up. Trickle is running Goodyear tires, so maybe that shoots down all his speculation. Uh, again, he may have his car balanced perfectly. It's working well, and his tires are working well. For the lead, car number 84. Trickle goes up in front, and he's only the third different winner. Usually you have a scramble for the lead. That's not been the case here in our coverage of the Pontiac Excitement 400 from Richmond today. Anything but that. It's been all Bodine and Wallace until this moment. Isn't that ironic? It's got a yellow rookie stripe on the bumper, and it just drove by all my Winston Cup rich heroes, Dick Trickle. And uh, 
These boys are going to have a hard time, but this is Dick Trickle's kind of racetrack. He spent his life on these kind of racetracks, and the man has a little bit of experience. <laughs> You bet he does, Johnny, and more than that, he's got determination and will. He's almost 40 years old. He knows this will be his shot at Winston Cup, but he's going to follow in the footsteps of his fellow Wisconsinite there, number seven, Alan Colwicki. He's got to do it right now, and he got the opportunity when Mike Alexander, the driver of that car who sat on the front row here a year ago, was injured. Dick doesn't want to wish any ill on anybody, but as long as he's in this car on pit road, he is definitely going to take a shot at holding on to that ride. Let's go to Mike Joy for the pit stop. Well, Dick Trickle, America's favorite and winningest ever short track driver, near 50 years old. He's a rookie here on this circuit, signed to run Rookie of the Year. The lead car making its pit stop, right side tires, and they are staying on the good years, defying what has been the conventional wisdom of today. Right in front of that car looks pretty good. Trickle is down, and with that jack drop, he's away. No unusual tire wear on Trickle's right side rubber. Back underway, Trickle in his 18th Winston Cup race. Phil Parsons, 1970. Phil Parsons just drove by Rusty Wallace and Jeff Bodine to take the lead. Uh, it seems like uh, Jeff and Rusty's cars have gone away a little bit, and uh, Trickle just flew by them, and then here Phil just drives right by them. So uh, I'm not sure what's happened to their car. Phil Parsons from out of nowhere, from dead last on the field, from almost not making it today. There you are, Robbie with him in the Crown Petroleum, number 55, has really turned this race around. It's been one of his finest afternoons. I'll tell you what, he's had some of his worst afternoons in Richmond, Virginia. Terrible so here. We've been with him several times, and going back to 84, it's, it's not been much fun for him, but it's certainly turned around here in 89. His best finish in this race has only been a 15th. He's done that a couple of times. He's certainly making up for any old ground that he didn't cover before but he runs this Richard Jackson car beautifully. You know, we talk about Dick Trickle as a rookie, but he's had 17 races. You have to run five races in a year before you lose your rookie eligibility. And he has finally signed on, taking the gamble that this could be his year. Well, Dick Trickle's a rookie like A.J. Foyt was a rookie at Darlington a year ago. I mean, oh, the number, number two car. Number two spins down at turn two. Irvan around as Bodine is getting tagged by Rick Wilson coming out of four as they came to caution. Rick Wilson got into the side of Jeff Bodine and turned him sideways. They're able to collect it back up. There you see the four just in front of him. Ernie Irvan is back away. Caution is out. Fifth one of the afternoon. So two of the a lot of these guys. This is going to come at the right time. For some of them, they came in a little earlier. Sure, I think everyone wanted to get a tire change. Uh, the pace car has not gone on the track yet because it, the leaders, it missed Bill Parsons when it went by, so it's got to wait till all these cars go by, so everyone's going to come in like they should. And Parsons is the first one in. Phil Parsons catches the caution just when he wanted it. Phil Parsons on pit road, and it's wholesale change of position. We'll be back with more of the Pontiac Excitement 400 from Richmond shortly. If you've been itching for the hot look, high performance, and driving excitement of a Pontiac Grand Am, now's the time to act. You feel excitement. Get on your Pontiac and ride! Get 4.9% GMAC financing on a hot handling Grand Am, or up to $1,100 cash back for qualified first-time buyers. Make your move. See your dealer for details today. Hey, come on. Can't you do that later? Hey. I've always dreamt of owning a car like this, and I'm keeping it forever. <laughs> to some, it's an antique. To others, it's a dear old friend. If you truly love your car and want to make the romance last forever, protect it with Pure Later Filters. If you love cars, you'll love Auto Week, the news weekly of motoring. Every week, Auto Week puts you inside the world's most exciting cars, GTs, sports sedans, collector cars, 4x4s, front drivers. Auto Week makes you an insider with industry news, personality profiles, old cars, columnists, the best classified anywhere. And nobody covers racing like Auto Week. 
you get the fastest coverage of Formula One, sports cars, stockers, Indy cars. It's all in Auto Week, the news weekly of motoring every week. Call 1-800-554-2828 to get a full year of Auto Week at our special discount price. Just $17.25 for 52 issues, only 33 cents a week. You'll save 83% off the newsstand price. Call 1-800-554-2828. Let Auto Week put you in the driver's seat every week. We're under caution here at Richmond, Virginia. It was here at Richmond 18 years ago that Richard Petty began his streak of 513 consecutive Winston Cup starts. That streak ended here yesterday. Petty tagged the wall in turn four in practice yesterday and was unable to get that car spruced up for qualifying. And after a few moments of solitude, Richard spoke to Chris Economaki. 28 years ago when this was a dusty dirt track, you won here, Richard. And now on a beautiful new modern speedway, you're going to be a spectator. What does this do about your, make you think about yourself and, and being a racing driver? <laughs> you want to stay on this business much longer? Well, you know, I think it makes you more determined. Every time you have a setback, you just work that much harder to get it straight out. And we've been, we've been having trouble here, I don't know, last three or four years, I guess. And uh, the situations have been that a lot of stuff's happened that's not been our, under our control. Just freak things happening, uh, running over stuff on the racetrack and cutting tires or blowing up in the pit and burning people and, you know, stuff like that that don't usually happen to anybody anywhere and it's happening to us. And, uh, you know, it just makes you say, okay, guys, no matter what they're going to throw at us, we're going to throw something back at them and that's what keeps us coming back. you think the NASCAR owes you a start uh, in the race tomorrow? I don't think it. You know, you have preferential treatment, but when somebody's been doing as much as we have over the period of years, they ought to be able to kind of bend something from time to time and make it work. What's going to be going through Richard Petty's mind when you turn the night out tonight in bed? I'm going to sleep. That's what I'm going to do. I ain't going to worry about it. Nothing I can do. Richard Petty then quietly went home to Level Cross, North Carolina to spend Easter with Linda and the grandchildren. Through all those years, all those wins, those broken bones, those fiery crashes, the graciousness of the man never changed. And he still has a lot of fans wherever he goes. And I'm one of his biggest. I mean, the man's not only great on the racetrack, but I cannot put into words how I respect him as a human being, his lifestyle, and the way he helps people that need help. I mean, he is the key. He has changed the perception of American stock car racing. We owe him a lot. Pace car bringing the field down by, and we are showing 185 laps complete here today at Richmond, Virginia. On the old fairground, it took on a brand new attire after Richard plowed this track up a few years ago. Remember that? Yeah. I, they're showing one lap until they get ready to turn them loose once again. One lap until they are back underway. Richard Petty. <laughs> No matter what the circumstance, remember at Atlanta when uh, he had a tire go down, he hit the wall so hard? We have a problem here up front. Uh, Rusty Wallace just drove by. Phil Parsons beat Rusty Wallace out of the pits, and Rusty Wallace just drove right around him under caution, jumped in front of him. I'm seeing him lift now and getting line. I'm sure NASCAR got word of their pit crew, so Rusty was going to try to make his position up real quick. On the tail end of the lead lap would be the car number nine, Elliot, as I understand it. Yes, that's and correct. And then uh, actually leading the race is car number 55, Bill Parsons. And behind him comes Rusty Wallace, and then Dale Earnhardt is in third. Alan Kowicki is in fourth. In fifth is Jeff Bodine, and sixth is Davey Allison with seventh Rudd, eighth Rick Mass, ninth is Dick Trickle as they go back under green. On the break, Parsons backs up. He didn't come up through the gears at all, and they sweep by him. Wallace goes by. Earnhardt goes by, still trying to get that car collected. He's being challenged by Kowicki. Now he seems to be at speed as he comes out of turn number two. You're riding with him there on that restart. Either missed the gear or is lacking a gear as they came to the line. For the lead, up in front, the black number three on the inside. On the outside is 27, Wallace. Well, we had a close call with Sterling Marlin, Allen Kowicki. They got together coming out of uh, four, but they pulled it back in. Look at Elliott, broken wrist and all, trying to salvage this lap. He's running on the tail end of the lead lap. Wallace trying to bag him right here. 
187 laps complete into turn one. Wallace on the inside. Elliott goes a lap down. And he isn't all the way down. He's fighting his way back out of two. He's got a good line. Now the pinch. And Elliott has to lift. So Wallace stays first. Earnhardt second. Kowicki third. Parsons back to fourth. Despodine is in fifth. It has been the Wallace-Bodine two-ring circuit from the outset on this Easter day. This is the start of the race. And car number 55, just for whatever reason, I don't know, this is, this is right on the restart, and that's, that's when they got together. You could see them, and that was a real close call for Allen because he almost went around. And it's, it's just coming out of here. I thought we were going to see when they, when they, when they went by him. Yeah, I think Phil must have missed the shift or something because they, they all went by real quick. And the car you saw, Kowicki bouncing off, is fairly Marlin on the inside. Well, I think you get so pumped in a race car, it's very easy to do. Kowicki goes up into Phil Parsons, almost loses it there. He uh, He's off the, he's off the pace. Everyone's driving by him on the outside. Something happened to Allen. There you see the uh, white and blue and several other colors, number seven. Falling on the inside, here's the 15 going up. Brett Bodine around him in the Bud Moore car. That's right, they go under you, yeah. above you. He's, he's got a tire down. He's got a left rear tire down. That's and he may spin and take him, and he's not careful. Oh, here he, he goes. The All the way around, that's going to bring them. They're going to clear him. That could be a good break for him. If he can get this thing going around and get it back across the start finish line, he will not lose the lap. He's trying real hard to do that. Here comes Rusty Wallace after him. Let's see if he's able to make it. He looks okay. like he just he came out of the bleach box. Bill Elliott trying to get his lap back. Get his lap back. back. Gets it. Elliott got his lap back at the line as Wallace lifted. And nine is being reported as two laps down. That's one of them back. That was a beautiful move. Now, that's racing. That's big-time auto racing right there, buddy. Wouldn't you like to see that one again? I mean, here was Kowicki limping. Lots of smoke. Wallace lifted for fear that he was going to run over something in there and apparently the man on the radio for car number nine said stand on it that's just what elliot did and retrieves a lap see now kawiki because he was just on the verge of being lapped he has to go all the way around black this flag for kawiki consultation flag goes out for kawiki they want him in no i think what they're doing is you have to black flag him because he's down but i think he's going to go around as fast as he can because he's on the tail end of the lead lap and he wants to jump all the way around the racetrack Grab two tires, come back out, and he will still be on the lead lap. But here it is in replay there, Allen. He was trying to get in, and he and Rick Wilson, he slid up into Rick Wilson and just went right around because they had that left rear tire down. But it may pay off to his advantage. You can see Kawicki coming around at full speed, and I believe he's going to make it in time to get those tires to stay in the lead lap. He's lucky he didn't collect that wall at the end of the pit road. Lake Speed and Rick Wilson have been penalized two laps for stealing a lap, one lap for doing it, they say. We'll more on that in a moment. Here at Richmond. Turner Network Television, the new channel on cable TV with all kinds of good stuff. TNT, bringing back thousands of classic movies, more than 250 every month. TNT, the exclusive home of Muppets, Fraggles, Gorgs, and Doozers. TNT, new original motion pictures. Movies you can't see anywhere else. The good stuff's on TNT. If you can't find the new TNT channel, consult your listings or check with your cable operator. When he's working, when his work is done, a man wants a gene he can feel comfortable in. American Hero Jeans. From Wrangler. Jeep Racing Team. The winningest team in off-road racing goes nowhere without craftsman tools. From their durable precision power tools to hand tools that are guaranteed forever. So, make sure it's a craftsman, because you don't want to get stuck with anything else. We both 
have colds. Why is he bouncing around like it's a great morning anyway? Well, I'm so tired and cranky and headachy, I can't even get started. Why? Because last night when he said, let's take NyQuil so we can have a good morning, I said, why? What's the nighttime sniffling, sneezing, coughing, achy, stuffy head fever so you can rest medicine? Got to do with morning, silly. He took it. I took sneeze. <laughs> why? NyQuil. It's also the bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, fully rested, so take it at night and have a good morning medicine. We're just two laps away from halfway here in the Pontiac Excitement 400 at Richmond, Virginia. Out in front is Rusty Wallace. Dale Earnhardt is in second. Phil Parsons trying to maintain third. Davey Allison in fourth. Ricky Rudd fifth. Jeff Bodine sixth. Alan Kowicki had been in seventh. But there have been problems on the Kowicki car. And for more on the story, let's go to pit road. Ken, one lug nut. That's what brought Alan Kowicki back in the pit. They came around, changed all four tires, including the one that was shredded. But the man on the left front tire got four of those nuts tight. And the last one, well, the car dropped on the jack before he could tighten it up. So Alan, when he hears the feel of the jack drop the car, he goes. We're one lug nut short. Art Krebs, the NASCAR inspector, was right on the scene. He said, got to get them all, boys. So they brought him back in. Now he's down a lap and a half as he comes back on the track. So Kowicki, who was a major contender, now runs outside that lead lap and falls back. But Kowicki still has been going to play. He's really been in the fly, so uh, I think he has to settle now. The leader continues to be Wallace, but now he has Earnhardt to contend with. The best of friends off the track. Let's see what happens on track right now. Here's Harry Gann has his car working. Harry Gann's one lap down, but uh, he has pulled right up on the bumper of Earnhardt. He'd love to get that lap back. There you see Harry Gant. He's doing better these days. Remember, he had to have his leg rebroken, and they put metal in it to try to get him back together after that awful crash. So he had a sharp thing on his as, uh, Neil Bond. Neil Bond. And oh, oh. West Wallace coming down pit road. Wallace coming in. Unexpected. He must have had a tire equalized. Now Harry Gant will get aggressive after uh, Earnhardt because he needs that lap back. Yeah, yep. trying to make up a lap. They're now going the to the right side on the 27 car. It's one of the best crews in America, you watching there, fans. They are fast. Tire change and out. He still may go a lap. 9.9. .9. Look at that stop. Two tires gas in 9.9 .9 seconds. Whew. Just like your crew used to be, John. Oh, no, we weren't quite that fast. But we did win the National Pit Crew Championship, and I'm glad you brought that up in 1984. Huh. A minute and a half. What? Well, yeah, we had different rules. <laughs> then. We won. Here's Harry Gann at car number 33 on the inside, getting that lap back. Well, I think Harry has his car working now. And uh, he and Dale sort of... Oh, tire, together. car in the wall in turn one. It is Neil Bunn, or rather, it is Terry Labonte's car, number 11, it appears to have socked the wall, and here comes Gant to race get that the lap flag. Back, coming to the line. A tremendous fight to try to get his lap back at the line. He did. Looks like Gant got the lap back. He made it. Well, you could hear a tire blow. You could hear it like a howitzer going off up here and slamming head on into the wall goes car number 11. Terry Labonte. Really tearing up that Junior Johnson car. Hit the front end, hit the back end. That one really took a beating. Leader is on pit road. Earnhardt comes into the pit. Parsons pitting. Waltrip pitting. Schrader. Rick Wilson comes in. Bill Elliott has made up a lap. Gant has made up a lap. Field tightening up here in Richmond after a disastrous crash for Terry Labonte. Just over the halfway mark in this race, we're at lap 208 now, Terry Labonte dove into turn number one, and it exploded like a cannon. And the car ripped into the wall in turn number one, almost head on, then spun and took the back side of the car as well. Now, Terry Labonte has come out of the machine. He has walked to the uh, rescue squad, and he's being taken back in for a checkup, but he really took a lift.
as we reported, he walked to the ambulance. And he is now being taken to the infield here. You know, Ken, we said earlier that uh, the wall at the entrance of Pitt Road came almost came into play a couple times today, and that's one of the questions that uh, all the drivers had. Is that a dangerous situation? There you see it. And they discussed that the same situations at Atlanta and at Dover, they went through several places like that. Neil Bonnet said he didn't care if they put it in the infield. They'd race against it low. Going to run it within an inch. Yeah, so... And they moved that wall some from a yeah, year ago. Yeah, and they... they angled it off a year ago look when it was further out on the track remember what happened to patty Sinko? that was pocono pennsylvania and then remember this awful crash at atlanta don marmer at atlanta and this terrible crash in the arca race he's still on the men from that one and that's what concerns the driver so they did cut an angle to it but dick Beatty said today in the driver's meeting they're working on all these walls to angle them at an angle where it won't come into play that way. So it, it is something that NASCAR is on top of and trying to improve. And of course, another major concern that it has been for many years, and certainly after last week is on everyone's mind, is fire. Chris Economaki has more on that. Well, that fire last week at Atlanta triggered some real quick action by Bill Simpson, the safety equipment manufacturer. You can see Kenny Myler, Dale Earnhardt's gas man with his new apron on helmet with a law collar. I've got an example of the helmet here in my hand. This is flame retardant no material. It comes down inside the apron. Now, if any gasoline is spilled on this apron, it repels it. Now, however, if it's attached, the apron is attached by Velcro fasteners, so it's a quick release apron. You can pull it off in a matter of moments. And of course, he's got his fireproof gloves on as well. And underneath the apron is the Nomex flame retardant suit. So he's very well protected from the fire. That fire so frightened people here at Richmond, the two corporate executives from the Sun Oil Company sponsoring uh, Sterling Martin's car are here watching the race in Nomex flame retard material. And for more on this story, let's go pit, go pit road to Mike Joy. Chris, I'm in Phil Parsons' pit, and you'll see that many of the men here are dressed in fireproof suits, not just the fuel men. Roger Fortney, who's the second gas man, he's got a suit on, and so does Ronnie Aycock, the primary gas man. But Jack Man Gary Brooks, the catch can man Roger Owenby also wears a suit, so does rear tire changer Tony Lambert and tire carrier Corey Scott. Gary, all of you guys are wearing fire suits. Now, this isn't required. You folks have taken it on your own. Well, you know, with the incidents we've been having lately on pit road and stuff, everybody feels like it's a lot safer. You never know if anything can happen, and if it does, you won't be prepared for it. There's only one man on this crew that goes over the wall without a flame-proof suit. That's Claude Queen, the front tire changer. Someday, perhaps, we hope, soon, uh, he'll be kind of like Ron Duguay, one of the few NHL hockey players to go on the ice without a helmet. Nomex is becoming uh, the sartorial splendor of Pitt Road, as I know Chris would say. Well, what these folks can't remember is Eddie Thrapp, who works with the U.S. Tobacco Motorsports Program, is a close friend with Bill Simpson, and they decided at that point to do definitely to go ahead and make these people wear uniforms. And Eddie Thrapp's the one that started this thing. There's Brett Bodine's car being pushed off. He had the car just break down out here. His brother is back on pit road. And they're looking over the right side of that car, taking some time right now on car number five. Not sure what the situation is here, but that looks serious on, on Jeff Bodine's car number five. More. From Richmond, short. From the Pontiac Pace car, the view looking back over the field here in the 400 at Richmond today, Phil Parsons is leading. Rusty Wallace in second, Earnhardt third, Davey Allison fourth, Ricky Rudd is in fifth, Larry Pearson sixth, Dick Trickle seventh, Alan Kowicki is in eighth, and then in ninth, the lap down is Ernie Urban with Darrell Waltrip in tenth being shown a lap down. Gant is in 11th, being shown a lap down. And Shirley Marlin is in 12th. Two laps down in 13th is Rick Mass. As we get set to go, Mike Waldrop is running 14th, Bill Elliott in 15th. And they're putting out the caution for still another lap as they sort out this field. Well, what happened is Dick Trickle has been fighting up front with uh, the eight car for a spot. Now he's coming on down pit road. He's got a tire going down. If you look at the 84 car coming down pit road, he's... I'm sorry, 84 car 
has a right front down. You can see the sparks flying, and that's what he was trying to do is get in. And you can see as he goes by, he's going by Jeff Bodine. Here's the situation on Bodine. Brake caliper, right rear is locked up, and Mike Joy has more on that story. Well, if you can see inside that full-face Simpson helmet and the Nomex hood, you'd see a long face on our pole sitter, Jeff Bodine. Jimmy Johnson's the team manager for Hendrick Motorsports. Jimmy, what's the problem? Oh, we love his brake caliper. High rear brake caliper. How long did it take you to replace it? Uh, it took about five minutes. We lost about three or four laps. Okay, they replaced it on the right rear on Jeff Bodine's car. He will rejoin the field. Laps down. These cars run four-wheel disc brakes, unlike their uh, street look-alike counterparts. And so making a change like that is fairly easy. But here, time and lap consuming. Dick Trickle, they're making a four-tire stop down there. And uh, they're getting ready to drop green. So uh, she's certainly in danger of losing the lap. Heel coming down out of turn number four. Trickle is away as he tries to come up to speed. Heel breaking on the track just on the tail end of the lead lap with Alan Kowicki in the seven. So therefore, the 55 car, which is leading, is directly behind him. But he can't come up to speed on the start. And he falls back 10, 15 cars immediately. Everybody trucking underneath Bill Parsons as you're riding with him. That car just will not come up through the gears. And therefore, we have a new leader coming by to the strike. Give it to number three, I believe. Earnhardt as your leader. Earnhardt in first, Wallace in second. Yeah, there's something serious wrong with Phil Parsons' car. He must have a tire going down or something because he went straight to the wall when uh, he came up. He's coming in for a pit stop. Phil Parsons, number 55. Ducks on the pit road is number three, Earnhardt. Draws away. So what the circumstance here was on him. He had such a great run this afternoon. But it's all coming untethered at lap 218. They're changing right side tires. I'm sure he had a tire going down, and he will be going down the lap right now. He's sitting in his car on pit road as they clean off the windshield. Meanwhile, the field thunders by, and he goes down a lap. Getting back on the track, 13 seconds and back underway comes Phil Parsons. Not going down a lap was Dick Trickle in the 84. He's running just barely in front of the leader by about two and a half to three seconds over the current number one man on the field, Earnhardt first. In second is Davy Allison in the 28. And with him comes Rusty Wallace. And there's where the challenge is. Now Davy Allison, who came from dead last on the field. There's the sword out, and boy, what a scramble that is for second. And isn't it Richmond, Ken Lee? Uh, you get about halfway through the race, and all of a sudden, the guys that look like the good horses start slipping to the back. Paul Wickey went back with his tire problem. Bodine has a brake lockup. He's out of there. Trickle has a tire problem. He's on the tail end of the lead lap. Parsons, who had come from the back all the way to the front, now goes a lap down. And through it all, old Davey Allison just marches from, what was it, 36 starting spot all the way to second place. It's going to be interesting to see who can survive to the end of this thing. Now he's running in third, 27, Rusty Wallace is there. Wallace getting around him in a great battle for second in heavy traffic. One thing today, Ken, we have not had a really dominant car. I think Jeff Bodine early was a little stronger than everyone else, but I think there's several people that can win this race because this is a racetrack that's proven already people can get their laps back. Here we go, 21 car into the wall, spinning. Around goes the Wood Brothers, number 21. Mentioning Neil Bonnet in trouble. This is a break for Trickle. They're going to race all the way back to the line. Coming to the strike. Kowicki will make up his lap. That'll get Kowicki back in the field as the caution comes out again. Major break for Alan Kowicki, and I believe for Larry Pearson as well. Larry Pearson has gone down a lap. I think he's going to get one back here. Talked to David Pearson this morning. And there's the spin and the, the tire. Yeah, and I think the car, boy, it just jumped right in front of the six car of Mark Martin. He was so lucky to miss this. Watch how close it is. Look at Ricky Rudd. He just misses it. Watch him spin right back in front, just barely. 
So for another time, it's a caution situation here at Richmond this afternoon. We'll be back with more of the action. There's plenty of it in a moment. The promotional fees and considerations have been paid by the U.S. Air Force Reserve. Winning on a NASCAR circuit takes dedication, teamwork, and a strong will to succeed. You'll find that same spirit in the Air Force Reserve. We've got a place for you on the winning team. And by Crown Central Petroleum Corporation and Fast Fair Convenience Stores, proud sponsors of Phil Parsons' car number 55. And by Pontiac, America's road car company. Pontiac, we build excitement. Showing 229 laps complete here today. 171 to go, 128 miles remaining. Out in front, Bernhardt, Wallace second. And Ricky Rush is being shown third on the field. Phil Parsons has stayed fourth. Caution helping him out a little, keeps him up in the hunt. The big story is Dick Trickle who's coming out of the back of the field and finding his way up through. There he is. There he's up, caught up. Almost lost the lap in the pit. Got out here just in front of the field. This latest caution has given him an opportunity to catch up with his field, and he is shooting from the rear, barreling through traffic now as he tries to catch up with those leaders. Car number 84, Trickle. Here are the, here are the men up in front. There's Earnhardt and Wallace running one and two, and here's Wallace coming into the pit. Rusty Wallace is back on pit road. Here's Mike Joy. Wallace with the pass. We'll go up to that end and Chris Economaki. Well, we're here with Kirk Schumer, Don Dale Earnhardt's crew chief. We know he's leading Kirk, but Davey Allison's right on the last row, and he's up to second. Is Dale upset? Can he handle that challenge? Well, we'll just have to see. The tires are kind of unpredictable today, and uh, we're just going to have to play the whole race by ear. Has Dale complained about his tires? He can't run them hard without tearing them up. Ah, uh, there's the secret right now from Kirk Schaumadine. Dale Earnhardt's crew chief. Back to you. Can't run them hard without tearing them up, was what he was saying. Yes, about the tires. And when and Dale is such an aggressive race car driver, and so is Rusty, and I think they're punishing the tires a little bit. I tell you, Bo Dine, who is down several laps, is not that far behind, and Harry Gant, who is down one lap, is right on uh, Bo Dine's bumper. So these guys won't very much run Earnhardt down to try to get a lap back. Let's review the top five for you. Earnhardt is in front. Ricky Rudd now shows in second. Alan Kowicki is third. Davey Allison is in fourth. Dick Trickle is in fifth, Larry Pearson is in sixth, Rusty Wallace in seventh, and they are being shown in the lead lap. And it has been the excitement of the moment to watch the car number 84 from the Savola Racing Team with Dick Trickle bounding through those lap cars as he tries to get back up front and contest for the lead. He is running right behind Mark Martin at the present time. Meanwhile, Earnhardt. Gets a breather out in front. Oh, Phil Parsons up into the wall. He tried to go three wide there. He's facing traffic in turn two. Looks like he's uh, bent it pretty good on the back. Phil Parsons, car, yeah, he really has bent it all the way. Looks like he's taken that rear clip all the way to the ground. Yeah, I think... Uh, I think that one will be uh, bent bad. You're live inside of Phil Parsons' car after he took a hard hit. Bouncing off the wall. Let's watch it again. You can see the he just hits the quick dry and just zips right in there. And that's the same thing, basically, that happened to him in practice. If you get too high here, the car will just go right around on you. It's almost identical to the car that he destroyed in practice. This is his second car here this weekend. And this one is not looking any too well. Boy, look at that front end. It's really a shame for them to run as well as they ran and uh, had the problems they had, but uh, they sure had good showing today, but I think they're out of it now. Bad break for Richard Jackson here and his team with Phil Parsons, the driver, in the crown car. There you see it again, slapping the wall in the rear, then turning around, taking the nose. And he had put on some exhibition as he had come from way out back to come up through traffic, give it a good shot, now, from his point of view, let's see what happens, John. He had to dodge. Those two cars touched. Rick Mass 
in the 66 car got together with Michael Waltrip and he made an evasive move to go high and he got up too high and the car went just around on him. It's just nothing Phil could do except do that or run into the back of Michael and Rick. So uh, that's just one of those things in racing you just can't fix. Well, there's the car that remains the number 55 and the Crown Petroleum car is now out of competition here at Richmond this afternoon. New leader, Davey Allison, appropriates first position. Inheritance the issue here for him as they come by. We'll be back for the start again in a moment. Continuing coverage of the Pontiac Excitement 400 is brought to you by Wrangler, made in the USA. And by Sears, where you get your money's worth and a whole lot more. We're live in the STP Pit Communications Center here at Richmond International Raceway, where the leaderboard is as significant for those who are not there as for those who are. Davey Allison has climbed the ladder from dead last to lead the race. He's your defending champion. Larry Pearson, thanks to the shuffle on the caution flag, has ascended to the runner-up spot. Dale Earnhardt is the dominant force in the race right now. He's the only guy who's been able to get to the front and stay there all day, although they are battling tire problems. Alan Kulwicki has had all sorts of adventures, has been as much as a lap and a half down, but has now regrouped to rank fourth and on the lead lap. And Ricky Rudd, likewise, remember he was Johnny Hayes' pick to win this race, had problems early, is now back in fifth spot. Question is, what happened to the guys who were up there? Well, for Jeff Bodine, it was a brake caliper that lost him about three or four laps. And now Rusty Wallace has dropped out of this lead quintet. To find out what happened to him, let's go to Pit Road. It's Chris Economaki. Well, if you can take a look at the left side of Rusty Wallace's number 27, you can tell it's the Richmond of old. There's tire marks along the left side of the car. However, the car is in good shape, says the crew chief. They had to make a stop a few laps ago to get a wheel nut tightened. The reason for that was the wheel wrench went bad. And now they just went up to talk to one of the officials here about some problem that Rusty, who's getting to be pretty, pretty political behind the wheel. But right now they say that the car is in good shape and should be doing well once the green flag comes in. Here he is one more time. And you can see those marks on the side of the car where somebody has been rubbing up against him. Now this is a surprise stop with his pit crew. And it's right front tire there. As Kirk Schoenberg said, you can't run these tires hard without tearing them up and Rusty Wallace is not a conservative driver. Okay, let's go down pit road to Mike Joy. You're looking at Robert Yates, team manager, a team owner now for uh, Davey Allison. Well, we talked to Davey at the front of the show, and he started back there in the poorhouse. You raced him up to second. Now you've inherited the lead with the caution flag. You didn't stop this time. Why not? Well, we, uh, 10 laps ago, we stopped, and uh, we'd already run 20 then. So we had stopped in, so we're staying out this time. The other guys have 30 laps on their tires. They're good for about 80, it looks like. So uh, we elected to stay out. If Davey runs the car hard, does he risk tearing up the tires? Well, he's having to be a little conservative. Uh, as easy as he can be, but, you know, you can't be so conservative and uh, not get laps. So we've been just managing to hang on, and uh, so far the brakes been going our way. Now, the next set of tires you have lined up here are scuffs. They have laps on them. Why scuffs and not sticker tires, new tires today? Well, I don't think it makes a whole lot of difference. Right now, they're mounting tires as fast as they can, trying to get them glued up, and we'll probably change them to stickers after a while. Okay, Robert Yates. The busiest concession here at the racetrack is the tire concession at the present time. As you watch the leaders, there are the folks from Hoosier staying really busy. On the other hand, there's not too much activity over around the Goodyear area right now. I think the price goes down as the day goes on? No, I, I don't think price is uh, a factor. No, no discount, the blue light didn't come on around here anywhere? Yeah, when it costs these teams about $50,000 to run one of these races, I don't think they're going to try to save a few hundred bucks on tires. 244 laps are being shown complete, getting set on the start. Davey Allison started dead last. Now is the leader. Larry Pearson comes to second. Dale Earnhardt on this restart will be third. Alan Kowicki in fourth in the lead lap. Fifth is Ricky Rudd, and sixth is Rusty Wallace on the tail end of the lead lap. One lap down in seventh is Harry Gant, number 33. He was just in front of the leader, then came in and made another tire change just moments ago. And Dick Trickle is being shown a lap down in eighth. Waltrip is a lap down in ninth. Ernie Irvan is in tenth. And then two laps down is Sterling Marlin in eleventh, with Michael Waltrip twelfth. Bill Elliott, two laps down in 13th. 14th is Schrader. Now you've seen Curly Marlin's car. 
And this is the 11th place car, pace car, the Pontiac pace car drops on the pit road. And the Pontiac Excitement 400 is back underway with Davey Allison up in front. Walter trying to get a lap Ooh. back, and he gets pinched what off. What a move Earnhardt made right on Bodine. Uh, their old friends are back together, but you can watch this one get aggressive because Bodine put a big move on Earnhardt, and Bodine's down several laps. So uh, Darrell uh, Walter at better hopes that uh, he doesn't get caught up in this one. The yellow and white, number five of Bodine up on the high side. Remember, he is three or four laps down. Here comes Walter on the inside, and Bodine moseying along on this racetrack trying to take one lap back he's not done with this thing here's Waltrip a lap down in the 17 and the black number three of Earnhardt is the second place car back to the inside Bodine just reefs on that wheel Gets it to the bottom of the racetrack, holds it down there, and slams his way up the inside. He is going to get a lap back. Remember, there's bad blood between he and Allison after that incident at Daytona. I'll tell you, Rusty Wallace started all the way at the back and is flying through the field. He's right on the bumper of Dick Trickle in the 84 car. And uh, it's getting tough now. Everybody's starting to push and shove and bully. And... Uh, I think they think there's going to be a lot of caution, so Bodine says, hey, let's go for it. I might pick four laps up if we have enough caution. Less than 150 laps to go, and to the inside, car number three, Earnhardt, working for the lead. Here's Earnhardt on the bottom, and Allison tries to cut him off at the pass. And that very quick first turn. Still side by side into the back straightaway, and here's Earnhardt. As of old, right down there, using the shoulders, he comes up through. Davey Allison falling to second. Chevrolet goes in first. Ford is now second. Earnhardt is the kind of guy who can take an ill-handling race car and probably do more with it than any other driver in the world. In this case, his car owner, Richard Childress, says he has by far the best handling race car on the racetrack and has had all day. They're smiling like the cats who ate the canary down there because their car is working so well. They're not wearing out the tires. Childress says the reason these guys are blowing the tires and wearing out the tires is that their cars aren't handling as well, and when they try to stay out as long as we do, then they wear out their tires and we don't. So, Earnhardt not only is perhaps the best driver out there, certainly the point leader right now, but also has the best handling race car, and that means that the rest of these guys may be in very serious trouble. Well, you talk about Earnhardt, but I'll put another one right in the same category as being able to take anything, ill handling, good handling, whatever it is, and that is the 84 car for Dick Trickle. He is used to things that don't work very well, and this is the best chair he's ever set in when he moved into the Savola car. I wouldn't be surprised if he gets a crack at making that lap up there. You see him side by side with Wallace. And you know what was great last night? Dick Trickle and Rusty Wallace were having dinner together at the hotel. Best friends. And watch them lean on each other, bounce, not give each other an inch. You know, it, the contrast is unreal. Watch them get after each other. Meanwhile, just in front of them is Gerald Waltrip. He's trying to get a lap back, too, here. We asked Waltrip if it seems like everyone has won the first three races like it was the last three of the year. too but that, you know it's not just this year i've been saying that for the last year or two uh win at all costs win at any cost do what you got to do at mentality and i i never liked that uh well i won't say i never liked that i ain't liked it lately i think you got to <laughs> use a little discretion you got to give and you got to take and like i always say what goes around comes around if you give a little today you'll get it back tomorrow thoughts of the somewhat different Darrell Walter than we heard five or six years ago. Well, one thing I love about Darrell Walter, he uh, has already won two races this year, and he never was really considered the dominant car of the factor. The thing that's a little scary about Darrell, there are certain races he's going to dominate, and uh, he's off to just a heck of a start. A couple of wins already for the 17. Out in front is the number three. Bodine is running faster than anyone on the track. But he is running from several laps down after a brake problem, if you're just joining us. And if you are, there have been nine cautions to date, nine of them. Lead changes, nine among six drivers. Now car number 48 is putting out a little smoke. And it looks like that the 
car of uh, Mickey Gibbs, who has been in and out of the garage area today, is in trouble another time. He's back to the garage area. Mickey Gibbs running for Rookie of the Year. Here's your leader. Earnhardt in front, looking for his third win here. 36 cars started, 28 are left. Chris? Yes. Got a report from you, sir? Yes. Uh, here we have Bill Parsons standing at the back of his car. It's all apart. There's about eight men working on it frantically, trying to get it fixed so he can get back in the race. You can see Phil towards the back there with the no hat on, wondering whether that they're going to get the car fixed there. Cutting with welding torches on the front end, hitting the back end with a sledgehammer in a frantic try to get this car back on the track before the day is done. These guys are really working at it. Back to you. And trying to get Phil Parsons back in this race. Also trying to get back in this race and four laps down, officially reported, is Jeff Bodine. He is running 22nd, is the late word. We do one piece of business here. The member of the Richard Petty crew who was burned last week and has been in critical condition, they've upgraded that report now and say that it is serious condition. And he sure likes those cards. Robert Calicut. We'll give you an address here in a second if you watch second place. There you see the the number 27 car of Wallace. Remember that Alan Kowicki is in second. Baby Allison now third. There's another car that's interesting in there. The 33 of Harry Gant started dead last on this start. He changed from Goodyear tires to Hoosiers and is flown through the field. Look at this battle for the lead. Down to the inside, Alan Kowicki motors the fourth. That little team that has such a big heart and has such a marvelous way winning their first race in Phoenix a year ago. They're going back in front another time. Average speed in the last lap on this three-quarter mile track, 113 miles an hour, and Earnhardt will not let go. This is a good one. Chevy on the outside, Ford on the inside. Doesn't get much better than this. Ken, let's give Larry Pearson a call today. He's running in fifth place in the lead lap. Just done an outstanding job. Larry Pearson back in fifth, fourth is Wallace, third is A.D. Allison, and here's the confrontation for the lead. It is Earnhardt back on the outside, going for first place another time. How about that? Well, this is uh, the way it's supposed to be, and one good thing about Alan Kowicki, he's conservative, he's smart, he's not going to use the car up, but if he can stay right on Dale's bumper, maybe he can loosen Dale's car up a little bit, use those tires up, make him drive in a little deeper, and... Uh, take it a little easier than have to try to bang your way around. Remind uh, you racing fans around the country, Robert Chalica, who was burned so badly last week in that incident in Atlanta, Georgia. And he's in the hospital, be there at least better than a month. And that's the Humana, H-U-M-A-N-A -A hospital in Augusta, Georgia, if you want to drop in the note. A lot of people have, and he is most appreciative, and everyone in the Petty organization also comes around their appreciation for remembering him in this springtime period when things aren't so good for him. Robert Calicut. One of those guys whose names you don't know but contribute so much to this sport because of Adam and Adam and Cooper's cars. Well, that's, again, it goes back to how key the pit crews are and the people work on pit road. There's a dangerous situation. Here we go. Three cars for the lead. You know what I like about this sport, Johnny Hayes, as we watch Paul Wicke go by Earnhardt? These guys pay attention to these broadcasts, okay? So when somebody comes out and says, boy, Earnhardt's got the fastest car out here, he's the best driver of the bunch, and he's going to blow all these boys away, a couple guys like Paul Wicke and, and who's that in 27, Rusty Wallace, who was a lap now, say, what are these guys? Now let's go up there and show them who's really driving today. And Paul Wicke's now your leader. Earnhardt is second, but only until Rusty Wallace drives around him. It's a pretty good show, don't you think, Hayes? I think it's awesome, and uh, it's fun to see old Alan Kowicki, one of those old Yankee boys, come down here and run nice in front time. of a boy from St. Louis, an old boy from Kannapolis. Uh, whatever happened to that good old Southern sport? All these uh, other people are coming in now. 18 states are represented. I can remember there were drivers from three states in this race. 18 different states are represented in the starting grid today. Keep in mind, too, guys, that a bunch of those people that called North Carolina home didn't start out in North Carolina. They kind of moved down here, and they're Southerners by... Uh, 
by transition and not by birth. <laughs> Point right now, I think, is that Earnhardt, who was so good, is suddenly quite bad, and Colwicki, who was quite bad, is suddenly very good, and Rusty Wallace is right there with him. This is a whole new race, and we got enough time left that there might be another challenger emerge. Somebody else who was up there, like Trickle, for example, could get back up into the thicket. It's a good show here at Richmond. Let's go to Mike Joy for the tire story. Well, here's the production line at Hoosier. These uh, machines are much like in your local gas station, and nine technicians are mounting tires at the direction of Larry Talbert. The crews come up, and he kind of orders them. I bet Hoosier loyalists may get first shot. But the jam-up is over here. There's only two balancing machines. Robert Yates told us that they put thicker tires on that car when they had them ready. Here's his guy here, fifth in line for one of the two balancers. He may have to get a little aggressive like his driver, muscle his way up there, get those tires done, and get him back up to pit road. So the tire story continues to be a big one here. The battle for the lead is an exciting affair. And back in fourth place, Davey Allison is having all he can do with Larry Pearson. Here they are. There's the 28 on the outside and the 16 on the inside. That is the battle for fourth. Davey Allison is in fourth, and Larry Pearson having a dandy run. He's come up twice, pulled almost alongside up here in turn four a moment ago. He twisted it nearly sideways as he tried to run Davey down. Well, Larry's just done an outstanding job. And David, I'm sure he's tickled to death. But you can see the 28 car is starting to smoke those tires. And uh, Larry puts the pressure on him. And use those tires to hopefully dive under him. And, uh, of course, Davey just wants to keep him behind. Stay as low as he can. 16, Davey Pearson, uh, Larry Pearson in that fifth position. Closing on Davey Allison another time. This is for four. 274 complete of 400, 274 down. Turn one. Davey Allison hangs right in there. Larry Pearson who had a couple of great years in the Grand National Series of NASCAR, and here he is to the inside. Just inching along up in there. That's a good one. David Pearson, the owner of that Buick. Brother Rick Pearson, crew chief. And there's Larry Pearson snuggling down on the inside of turn one, sneaking through to take first place. David's going to be hard to live with. Uh, Larry, this is the best show Larry's ever had in the Winston Cup car. He's up to fourth place and uh, he's really done his job and he's not out of control. He's doing a super job. You see the yellow sticker for the rookie. And Shirley Marlin in 11th is also seeing him down on the inside going under Davey Allison. Billy Hagan car. Leader speed, 114 miles an hour. They picked the level this race up a bit. In front, Alan Kowicki by himself now at 114 miles an hour. Kowicki beginning to show some real strength here today. Remember that Bodine is running four laps down. The established route to the top of the Winston Cup standing is to sign on with a proven team, but the sport is occasionally blessed with an unlikely title contender who prefers to go it his own way. Alan Kowicki is a little like stock car great Freddie Lorenzen and Daryl Derringer. By outward appearances, he has no business in this business. It's a sport of the South. He's a man of the North. His foes traded higher education for a racetrack apprenticeship. He's a college-educated engineer. His trademark is self-reliance. For four years, he's run his own team. When he finally won a race, he turned down all the rich driving offers that followed to remain his own man. Kowicki could easily have won this year's first two races. He's tied for second in the points. You know, at Rockingham, the caution flags didn't go our way. At Daytona, we got a flat tire, but when you run that, that well, you're that close to winning, you can't be disappointed. Our morale's up right now. Well, we're here with Paul Andrews, Alan Kowicki's crew chief. He's watching what's going on over there. Paul, Alan owns his own car. Who runs his operation? Does he run it from the wheel, or do you run it from the pit here? Well, it's a, it's a joint effort. Alan and I both try to work together, and Bill Eagle and I, we work together in the pits and try to keep Alan calm down and keep everything going smooth. It's just a joint operation. We're all working together. How many more stops do you need for fuel? We're going to have to have two at this point. It'll take two more stops at this point. Okay, thank you very much, and good luck. you got an excited young crew chief in Paul Andrews. Back to you. Alan Kowicki, one of the 
smallest teams out here, only four full-time employees. But look at this young man run. Car number seven is Kowicki. Try to the midway. We leaned on Jeff a little bit that time and pushed him up, so Allen's getting a little more aggressive here, and Rusty follows right behind. Now we have the Bruce brothers running side by side, Rusty Wallace and Jeff Bodine. Somebody asked Allen what his favorite racetrack was, and he said it would be the first track I would win a Winston Cup race on. And Phoenix is not my favorite track. <laughs> And look who's tooting up and getting ready to go again. Phil Parsons. Uh, this is not going to be a whole lot of fun, but I think it's a tribute to the crew and the driver to take a car that's that destroyed and get back in. It shows you what Winston Cup points mean to these teams. Crown Petroleum Car, after that terrible hit and turn two, is going to come back out and go some more. And they race for points. Rick Wilson very loose up here in turn four, almost turned it into the fence. Gets it picked up and continues on. Meanwhile, the 21 car, which had a problem and spun, that car is back on pit road. Neil Bonnet, 15. Brett Bodine has been in for a couple of laps with a hood up on it. And car number seven, Alan Kowicki continues to pace this field. Wallace second, Earnhardt third, Larry Pearson fourth, Ricky Rudd fifth, and it is Davey Allison in sixth. One lap down in seventh is Harry Gant. Dick Crickle is in eighth. Darrell Waltrip is ninth, and Ernie Urban is tenth. Sterling Marlin, two laps down in the Billy Hagan car, stays 11. Phil Parsons is getting ready to come out, and his race car does not look like the race car. It uh, has no trunk. It uh, looks like it's in deep trouble. It's like a tree stop. <laughs> Watching Alan Kowicki on our Timex speed track here, we get him a lap at 23.69. That is not the fastest lap of the race, but it is within 400 thereof unofficially we still show rusty wallace as being the quickest man thus far but kowicki is running at speeds close to the quickest that we've seen throughout the race and as a result is able to pull away up front very impressive when you consider that this is the guy who blew a tire spun out got penalized on pit road and looked like he was history 288 laps complete this time by 112 to go as we watch kowicki going for his second winston cup victory staying out in front a great mystery to me about that driver and about that car. Here's a University of Wisconsin graduate. He talks like an engineer, and then he comes out here and he runs a, he probably is not as romantic a looking race driver as a Rusty Wallace, but you want to get somebody that can stand on the throttle and get it done. There he is. Meanwhile, car number 48 is back in once again. Mickey Gibbs has given it a try. I think he's about to retire totally for the afternoon. It's the Pontiac Excite 400 live on Turner Broadcasting. We're here in the SCP Pit Communication Center where Alan Kulwicki was leading when they all went to pit road. Not a routine pit stop. It is a yellow flag. Here's the key. Lap 296. It's decision time. You cannot change brands of tires in the last 100 laps. I've just been handed a note that says Ricky Rudd getting off those Hoosiers, getting on those good years for the run to the flag. So that will be a reversal of the trend that we've seen all day. Will other drivers do that? We'll be checking that out when we go back to green flag racing. The other big question, is Ken Squire an executive producer or not? We'll worry about that one after the race is over. Right now, we're going to let him call the action. Can we? There's trouble afoot here, John. Well, Dave, Dave Despain certainly doesn't know what he's talking about because I saw the Hoosier tires on Ricky Rudd just go back again. They did? Yeah. Let's go to Mike Joy. <laughs> it's tire troubles in the Ken Schrader pits, too. They take a pyrometer, measure the temperature on each tire that comes off the car. These just came off Schrader's. Here's the right front, 225 all the way across. That's very good. Now, you try to match that up on each tire on the car. Here's the left front, a little cooler, 215, 210, and 220. It's not carrying quite as much load. But get back here to the right rear, 230, 232 degrees, a blister, and a tread separation. These tires are good years. They've had trouble with those. These tires are Hoosiers. They've had trouble with those. What does that tell us? Ken Schrader's team has kind of missed the setup here, or perhaps he's just driving the rubber right off the car today. Sounds like there's a place for a new tire company there, John. You can put the Hayes tire up. Yeah. One lap, and they're going to be back underway. Uh, we could go with the Squire tire, Forget or Square it. tire. 
Is Alan Kowicki is first. Dale Earnhardt is second as we get ready for a go. Rusty Wallace third. Ricky Rudd fourth. Davey Allison fifth. Larry Pearson sixth. And only his tenth Winston Cup race. What a dandy job he is doing. He's just doing this. Richard Petty not with us today. Did not make the field after 513 state starts. And that string started right here in Richmond, Virginia, where his dad won the first Winston Cup race of that nature that was organized years ago. Richard won here on dirt. Did not make the cut. He could not make a provisional start. Davey Allison and Dave Marcus getting those provisional positions for the So Richard was not here. And NASCAR has worked so hard over the years to always make sure they maintain that marquee for the paying customer. I wonder if they might change their rules to make it Winston Cup champion to get an automatic position, but they'd have to work for it. They'd have to qualify or something. Where they stay aside so hard, but now the competition's so good. Got so many good cars running. It's tough on even great champions. Here we are, back underway. Kowicki out in front. Whoa, Dick Trickle loose for a moment. He's trying to make up that lap, and here comes Farm number three, Earnhardt. Now, Earnhardt and Trickle have run each other a lot over the past few years on those short tracks. Earnhardt likes to go out and run those half miles. So they know each other pretty well and know each other's style. A little bit of respect there. Well, Trickle's cut his barbed wire, so he's not a really bit afraid of either one of these guys. I mean, he's seen it all the time. And here comes Bowdown trying to make up another lap. If you watch the second place going to Rusty Wallace. Wallace taking over in second. Back to the strike comes car number five with about a three-inch advantage over number seven. Now Kowicki comes up on the high side, but it is it is Bodine down to the bottom, the man who set on the pole, trying to make up another lap. Kowicki runs him really hard now, and he's willing to stay on the outside. That uses up some rubber off those tires. They're flat racing hard, but when you have two cars running side by side, it lets everyone up catch up to you, and uh, Kowicki's not giving an inch because he's on the outside, and that's the toughest place to be. A year ago in this race, Alan Kowicki lost the crankshaft and put him out of this thing. Back in 87, he set on the pole. Remember, in 86, he came here and failed to qualify. Look at this struggle up in front as Kowicki is trying to contain Bodine. No question about it, that Waddell Wilson car is as fast as anything here, but Kowicki stays with him. And they line up in double file a little further back. Rusty Wallace getting into it. And Trickle trying to take a lap back. Those four cars, two of them, one of them, the 84, a lap down. The yellow and white number five, four laps down, and trying to get another lap. They got together. together. They got together because that's all the smoke fly, so it's getting a little touchy now. And, uh, Except with our statistician, Greg Fielding, three or four down on that number five now. Huh. So much for that. They're reporting four laps down a while ago. Now they got him at five, and I saw him take a lap back. I don't understand that at all. He didn't stay in the pit. It must be to just recount it. But I'll tell you what, Bodine is not giving up. Now he is getting taken on the outside by Wallace. Leader speed, 115 miles an hour. Well, that's an escalation of about three miles an hour, and that would tell me that Kowicki is willing to use up some of that car and some of those tires. But he must be very confident about the suspension on that machine that he does have the right handle to go that hard and take that kind of a gamble. Here comes Wallace in the Pontiac down on the inside. Leans up in there, gets sideways. That's old-time Richmond racing. Kowicki in the Ford stays first. The Pontiac in second. Reviewing for you the overall look of the field here. 303 laps are complete of the Pontiac Excitement 400. Richmond, Virginia, over 40,000 folks have turned out in beautiful weather on this Easter Sunday to enjoy this great event that was postponed because of snow. That happened a couple of years ago as well here at Richmond, Virginia. Eight inches of snow the week after the Daytona 500 brought us here on this lovely afternoon. Lead car continues to be number seven. Kowicki, Rusty Wallace right there and a couple of Midwestern runners who squared off against each other in the ASA competition for years. Now go forward in the big time. David? 
Kelly, we have a new fastest lap in the race, and it comes in the final 100 miles, and that's pretty interesting, I think. Alan Kowicki, obviously with a great setup and knowing that the checkered flag is waiting, clicks a lap at 23.43. My time at speed track tells me that's 115 and a quarter miles an hour. Pole speed was only 120. Alan Kowicki trying to win his crew, a time at speed track computer for every member of that crew. More importantly, trying to win this race, and from the looks of the way he handled Jeff Bodine there, he may have the car to do it. Earnhardt is third, Ricky Rudd is fourth, and John Hayes, at the outset here today, you were pouting Ricky Rudd as the one to watch. We talked about this tire business of Rudd. As we get under 100 laps to go, do you think he's ready to step up the pace and go for it? Well, he doesn't seem to be quite as strong, but he's been able to hold there the uh, entire time, and if the right break comes, but he's right there on Earnhardt's buffer, and he's certainly doing a good job. The leaders are running 115 miles an hour. So, you know, the speed is coming up. They sorted out a lot of traffic, a little more confident about running. In fact, it is a clear track halfway around for Alan Kowicki. He's not having to worry about lap cars at this moment. A car. There are still 36 running. A uh, correction on that. 36 started the race. And let's get a recount on the number of uh, cars that are falling by the wayside here. Ten cars out, 26 cars still running. That's the battle. And that is not the after 16 and 28 still after and fifth. There's a pretty good battle developing for third between three and 26. There you are. Third spot right there. Back to the lead. Car number seven, Kowicki. Alan Kowicki with the advantage. We asked him about this Richmond race and how it's treated him over the years. Well, it's been good and bad to me. I like the new track. We ran well here last fall. Uh, we were just uh, off a little bit at one point in the race and got a lap down. We made that lap up, but never got a chance to get another yellow to get back in contention. We've wrecked here. We've won poles. We've done everything but win a race, and that'd be the next thing. That's what we're looking for. Let me tell you another thing Alan Kowicki's looking for. If he wins this race, it would put him on the winner circle plan. And uh, that's worth several hundred thousand dollars to you over this year. Now, why wouldn't he be on because of winning Phoenix last year? Because they take the top nine people, and they had nine other drivers that finished higher in the point standings or won more races than he did. And he and Phil Parsons missed being on the winner circle because of that. So the first car that wins the race out here that's not on that program was on the circle. So Kowicki's looking at a $200,000 payoff or more just for the winner circle plan. 312 laps are now complete. Dave Despain, Chris Economaki, Mike Joy, John Hayes, Ken Swanner with you today. And as we watch the leader, now let's go back and take another gander at third spot. There's Earnhardt in the number three. And right with him comes Ricky Rudd, who had a second-place finisher a year ago. Several times today we've seen what we uh, described as blood feuds out there, guys between whom there is a bed of bad blood. And here's another pair right here that have been engaged during the course of this season. Happened up at Rockingham. Dale Earnhardt and Ricky Rudd bumped together. Rudd thought he could win the race. He said Dale hit him. Dale said, none. I'll have none of that. But the point is that there's always that desire in the back of your mind to even the score. And right now, Ricky Rudd may be thinking about that as he gets another shot of Earnhardt here. And remember, they are racing for third, so they're both very much in contention to win the race here today. A little like wrestling, you know. They're, they build up these rivalries between these guys. And interestingly enough, NASCAR has taken a new approach this year. They're having little encounter sessions for the drivers instead of disciplining them like they did a year ago with Earnhardt when he and Bodine tangled. Now they're bringing them in and sitting them down and the jokes say they bring them some popcorn and some soda and they look at the replays and they talk about what happened and we joke about it but in theory the idea is to get that feud settled with that incident so that they don't take it on down the road. I think it's an interesting approach and I think it further reflects how high the tensions run with these guys when they're out there racing for a million dollar championship. Isn't it nice that they've taken on some of those Eastern establishment ideas to help these drivers along? They're having these sessions to help them understand each other how would better. You, how would you like to sit down with Dale Earnhardt and Jeff Bodine face-to-face -face and have a logical conversation <laughs> with either one of them? Not possible. No, I'm not buying it. It's not helping. 
one of the healthiest runs here today is Ernie Irvine in the car number two. He is now running in 10th position. And he's looking for his first top 10 finish since 1987 back in the uh, Charlotte 500 in October when he uh, finished in eighth spot. And he nearly didn't make it. He crumpled the car so badly they had to take the second car off the truck. And he's having an excellent day in this car number two. That is the 10th place car running one lap down directly in front of him in the same lap as Harry Gant. And the closest to challenging him is a lap away from him in 11th, Sterling Martin, who is two laps down. So Ernie Irvine is having a good one. Meanwhile, Kowicki in number seven stays up in front. There you see Davey Allison, who has sorted out Larry Pearson. He's moved back into fifth. And here's Mark Martin in the number six car. He is running 15th and is being shown three laps down. There's Mark Martin in the sixth car, three laps off the pace. Roush car. Let's take a look at attrition thus far in the event as we get into the latter part of the race. Jim Sauter early out. Derek Coates, Greg Sachs, Rodney Combs. Morgan has retired. Eddie Beerswill's car. Terry Labonte in that hard crash in turn one. He walked to the ambulance. Brett Bodine is retired. Mickey Gibbs has been on again, off again. He is now out. That's the story of who is no longer here. This car number six, Mark Martin, driving the Roush Racing Team car. There's one that I still think in time to come, knowing Roush and his attitude about racing has to be a winner. Well, they qualified well, and they run well in every event. I think they're the same as all the other four teams. They're having to work hard to get that car balanced to get used to what it needs. And all the Fords have been just a touch off there, except for Wiki, I guess, and he's, uh, he's downtown doing well. Difference of a lap between them, a couple of Fords further back in the field getting a gander here. Mark Martin gets around Davey, but he's got some Duke going to do if he intends to get back into this one. And look at him go around Phil Parsons in that <laughs> terribly dilapidated car number 55. You could jog around and go by Phil Parsons right now. That car is hurt bad. That's like that old joke. If it was inside that beaten up old car and got the mechanic and said to his driver, can't you go faster than that? He said, yeah, but I have to stay with the car. <laughs> There's Phil trying his best out here this afternoon after a tremendous performance early in the day. Now let's take a look from the soldier's car. Next on camera, giving us these pictures from Ken Schrader's car number 25. And his day has not gone as he might have wished. He is running outside the top 15 now. They've had some problems on it. Bodine car had that brake problem. And what we've seen out of Bodine, I would think that he would be a major contender had it not been if, in capital letters, the caliper problem on a right rear brake. Well, I think early in the race, uh, Bodine was the dominant car, and uh, and he's still running well now. And you see uh, Mike Waltrip in the car number 30. Brand new car, first time out. Now, using up the old engine, Kenny Wilson, who left Richard Petty to go with his team, They've gone back to the old Richmond engine. And these new engines, they're preparing for Darlington next Sunday. Here's Bill Elliott's car, number nine. And he is back in 12th position. He is two laps off the pace, driving with a broken wrist in a splint. And as I mentioned earlier, if you weren't with us, yesterday in qualifying, the biggest ovation of the day, was when he put that number nine on the pole. It didn't stay there for more than 15 minutes, but when it did, this crowd showed their appreciation for this great Georgia driver. Mike Joy. And we're having a look at the Ricky Rudd pits as Larry McCrook the team uh, talk about team strategy and tire strategy. Down here, they're remeasuring tires, taking a look at the combinations to see what best can go on that car. Let's go to Chris Economaghi. I'm down here with Ernie Elliott. It's Ernie Ernie. One second. How does Bill feel? He's doing very well on the track. How's his wrist? I'm not very badly. I feel so. I really don't know. Are you happy with his drive? Are you happy with his drive? Are you happy with his drive today? Well, you know, there's not much else they can do except just ride around. That's about it right now. Can you make it to the finish with no more fuel? Back to you. All right. He's 
doing some riding around. Here he is, still well over 100 miles an hour. Staying with his field, just two laps down. Bill Elliott, driving hurt and smiling through it. 12th place overall. Running three seconds down is Rusty Wallace at this point to the leader, Alan Kowicki. There you see Kowicki in number seven. And even though Kowicki has an engine, engineering degree, John, in the University of Wisconsin or back in the 70s, late 70s, he says he'll probably never go back to the engineering field. You know what he's going to do when he gets out of this? No. He wants to own a restaurant. See, he's crazy. He's furious. Oh, it's great. Don't you know his mother and father are proud of him? They <laughs> spent all that money to get him through college and he's driving a race car. They could save their money. I hope Alan will give it back to him after if he wins this race, give mom and dad the money back. You're just a born troublemaker, aren't you, John? I'm going to call his mom and <laughs> I'm a little surprised at you. Here you are on big family day and you're out here playing around with these race cars like you have all your life and and it's your mother's birthday you're not even home boy are you a disappointment what well, I, I wanted to be at home with my mother i love my mother she's 68 years old today i should have been in church with my mother like i've been ever easter my whole life uh -huh. and uh i had to come up here and be with you and fred reinstein <laughs> i mean you know you got to have priorities Faith, and you're going to be here no matter what like another 50,000 here today <laughs> Alan Kowicki maintaining the lead by three and one-tenth seconds. Earlier, we asked Alan about his thoughts on that million-dollar bonus in the 1988 Winston Cup championship race. Well, it's really a little bit early in the year to be thinking about points because before the year's over, we're all going to have some misfortune. Everyone's going to blow an engine or have a wreck here and there. So it's really a little bit early to be thinking about points, but that million dollars, it's a magic number, and it's got everyone keyed in on that. Uh, everyone's thinking about it earlier than ever before. It's, it'd definitely be uh, the thrill of a lifetime to win that. That's Alan Kowicki. You know, among, the other, among the other marks that he has, he has record for the longest rookie acceptance speech in the history of the Winston <laughs> Cup Series. Bill Elliott got real loose coming out of four that time, lift those tires up. Uh, i tell you one thing that's always bothered me about people like Alan Swift. He's worked his whole life to make the money to be competitive. There's people like you worth 50 or 50 million dollars, and you're sitting there saying a million means too much to Alan, and it does. John, and, and you don't understand that kind of money. John, you tell more stories than anybody I ever Just watch the monitor. Look at him smoke the tires on car number nine. I mean, Elliot, here he is out here. Hurt. Watch him pick it up. I think that's a real good measure of Bill Elliott, the race car driver right there. That is not an easy thing to do with a broken wrist. Bill went to the doctor this week up in Indianapolis. He's had the sports medicine specialist, the Dr. Joe Randolph, up in Indy working on the wrist. And the doctor said, Bill, you got to drive with the brace, but you're okay. Basically, he got a clean bill of health. I think for Bill Elliott, the next half dozen races are going to be the ultimate frustration. Doctor says he's well enough to drive, to go out there and drive, but he's not able to do with the car what he needs to to win races. He's lost the momentum that he went to Daytona with, and now it's going to be very frustrating to sit there and wait for that arm to get well enough that he can really do what he needs to with that car. On the other hand, if he can make saves like that it won't be long until he's able to get in there and mix it up with Earnhardt and Waltrip and Paul Wicke and the boys and win races again. <laughs> I'll tell you what, this is a tough track here, but now he goes to Darlington, which will be just as tough next Sunday. He asked Bill about his wrist and how it felt. All right, doing pretty good. One on the layout. You know, at least I got it out of the cast now and out of a brace. I still got to wear a brace while I'm driving, but you know, it's not near as restrictive as the one I had in Atlanta. So, you know, I feel a lot more comfortable in the race car and I feel a lot more comfortable with what I'm doing. You know, now I just got to get back into racing mode. Twelve lead changes among seven drivers thus far. As Kowicki continues to lead and nobody getting close enough to compromise that. He's leading now by what, four seconds, five? Five and one tenth seconds between first and second. He's having just a magnificent run. Let's go to Chris. I'm down in Alan Kowicki's pit, and I just checked with the crew, and they say they can't make it to the end on the gas they have. They're going to have to stop. Most everyone else out here seems can make it to the end. So Mr. Kowicki's going to need more than a four-second lead if he expects to win. Back to you. 
Chris, I guess the question is, uh, is Rusty Wallace able to go the distance? Does he have the legs to take the Pontiac all the way to the finish now? Car number 27. Historically, Rusty has not gotten great gas mileage, but there's a guy, uh, number 17, he can stay out there and get some gas mileage. I don't know if he, he's still in it or not. But he's a lap down, and we have 343 of 400 complete, John. Yeah. Getting late in the day for Walter to make a move. He needs to be in the lead lap about now, and I don't see that happening. 25, Schrader, the Folgers car, with our Epson Super 4 camera. He's back on pit road another time as Kowicki continues to try to build anything up here to give himself just a little advantage so he can drop in, take on just enough fuel to get him home. Trying to do a Walter. If you, if you have to pull in here, I guess uh, Dale Earnhardt, Rusty, they tended all to get the same kind of gas mileage. Ricky Rudd tends to get better gas mileage. He's got Lou LaRosa, who we call Money Money on pit road. He left Dale Earnhardt for the money, I think. You know, and we just call him Money Money, uh, like Michael Jordan has Money Money, and Lou LaRosa has Money Money. So uh, Louie gets a lot of good gas mileage, so maybe. And Ricky Rudd is fourth. Yeah, so maybe Ricky Rudd will win. He's lying there in fourth. His time is running out, and he's very, very close to catching car number three, Earnhardt. There you see the Earnhardt car, the black number three, and the green number 26 is the Kenny Bernstein team, the Quaker State car, up on the outside, trying to pull through some machinery, going around Neil Bonnet, sorting that field out and looking for Dale Earnhardt. Is this man, Ricky Rudd, the winner here in 84. Remember when he won that race, he had to tape his eyes open. He rolled over about, what, eight or nine times down at Daytona? The Scotch taped his eyes open so he could see all beaten up and he came out here and drove just as fine a race before what is really a hometown crowd for him he's out of Chesapeake Virginia here he is Ricky Rod at number 26 last year second in this race won it in 84 and he was second here in uh, 81 new track of course this is a three-quarter mile track if you were with us last year you saw the old fairgrounds track this track has really followed the times, and our congratulations to the Sawyer family for this great facility. This is as good as it gets now, Winston Cup Racing. It is a beautiful track, not a bad seat in the house, and just about filled up with the exception of a new temporary grandstand they put in the back straight away. It's a great house here today. With the Kitty Bernstein car, it's amazing how many people in drag racing now watch Winston Cup Racing because Kenny's in it, Raymond Beetle's in it, uh, there's other people looking that they'd like to get into it. So all the people in drag racing now are starting to follow this sport. Well, Kenny Bernstein has contributed so much in every form of the sport, and this Ricky Rudd team, he wants it to be a national champion. Let's check on the fuel situation down on pit road. Talk to our pit reporters first to Chris Economy. 15 laps, 37 miles. You got enough fuel to go all the way? We're okay on fuel, Chris. Uh, we got a tight set of tires on right now. I'd like to have a caution. As far as fuel, I think everybody's okay. Thank you very much. Well, there you hear it from, Rick, from Rusty Wallace and crew chief. Cliff down here in the Dale Earnhardt pit. I think Danny Myers and his friends here are done. Earnhardt has enough gas to go the distance. But crew chief Kirk Schalberdine says he kind of laughed and said, I'm not too sure about the tires. So tires still as big an issue as they were at the outset. We thought that story might go away a little today, but that is not the case. Baker Spain called it. It is an issue and is going to be right to the finish. Alan Kowicki, you know, could have won that Daytona 500. Had a cut tire. Last 10 laps, he was out in front, and he had the fuel range to run that day right to the finish. With that cut tire, it gave the race over to the conservative, Darrell Walter, who came home the winner. Building toward a finish here, and the question is, has Alan Kowicki the mileage, the range, to make it to the checkered flag? A little over a month ago, when Alan Kowicki did not win the Daytona 500 due to misfortune, he said, I'm not that disappointed, because after all, you win Daytona, what's left to do in your career? You can bet that today he would like very much to win this Pontiac Excitement 400. We're in the SCP Pit Communication Center, where we watched Alan Kowicki lap Davey Allison. The fifth-place car is now a lap down. It is among these four drivers, Kowicki the leader, Wallace second, Earnhardt, who now has a bad set of tires and is sliding all over the racetrack, and Ricky Rudd. That's the quartet that will 
Bowl decided, and we're moving down toward the end here. The big question is fuel and whether this thing will stay green to the end. To call the excitement to the finish, let's go to Ken Squire. Lap 20 down, 40 to go. Kowicki stays out in front. Somewhat different than that inauspicious beginning for him on this racetrack back in 1985 when he wrecked in practice and didn't make the field. Came back here in 86. Didn't make it that year either. Qualifying was rained out. Field was determined by car owner Point. And he failed to have any and had to miss that one as well. My, how times have changed. Here's Earnhardt's number three running in third spot right behind Dick Triple. Let's go to the Michael Waltrip just bounced off the wall but he was able to continue. Got one car in the wall one car in the wall in turn number four it is Waltrip bouncing off the wall coming back to the line car number 17 has brought out the caution. That's wild. Michael hit in exactly the same spot. Then his brother Daryl came in. There must be something slick up there that uh, got him into it. You can see where the line is building up on the outside of four. It's the right side of the car which grazed the wall. It's able to continue. He made a good save on it. He hit it flush on both the front and rear. He didn't get one side in as it comes by. It doesn't look badly badly hurt. I guess the rear end got raked a little, but that was it. And there's some smoke coming out. It may be a tire rubbing on Darrell Waltrip's car. So now we're up to the 11th caution of the day. Here's Mike Joy. This could be the pit stop that wins the race for Kulwicki. He was last in here in lap 292. They would have had to stretch 108 laps. They're getting four tires. Bill Engel whips that jack around the car, Junior Johnson style. The lug nuts are already loose. Off go the tires and the new ones. Hoosiers go on. So Kulwicki will have four fresh tires, thicker tires, to go the distance. And he's away. Ken, how would you like to be there and going to have Earnhardt, Rusty Wallace right behind you, so they're going to go after Kowicki hard, and, and they're going to have fresh tires and rust. All four cars. We have four cars in the lead lap. Here's the situation. Caution created by Waltrip in turn four. Kowicki leading. All four leaders come in to take on fresh rubber. They have the fuel they need. They have all the security there for the distance to be covered. Kowicki was leading. Wallace was second. Earnhardt third. Rudd was fourth. Those are the four in the lead lap. Lap down fifth. Larry Pearson, Dick Trickle staying sixth, Davey Allison seventh, Walter Forsman was in eighth when he had that little altercation. Then in ninth is Gant, two laps down, Ernie Irvine is tenth, Sterling Marlin eleventh, Michael Walter twelfth, Bill Elliott three laps down in thirteenth, Lake Speed in fourteenth. Can you imagine finishing thirteenth with a broken wrist? And it's still painful, and I'm sure it's hurting by now, and he's still doing the job. He is something. Uh, 15th is Mark Martin, 16th is Rick Mass, showing 17th is Rick Wilson. So we get set for a shootout here today with 365 laps complete, just 35 to go. We square off to settle this Pontiac Excitement 400. Now as they shape up on cars, we have a Ford, Pontiac, Chevrolet, and Buick in the mix for the lead at the end of this race. If you don't know who to cheer for, you can cheer for a car. Here's a report on Rusty Wallace's car from Chris Economy. Well, the interesting thing about Rusty Wallace's pit stop was that all he got was four tires and fuel. They did not touch the chassis. No adjustments. So Rusty's happy with the car, and I'm wondering what if the story was on Kowicki's pit stop, if any adjustments were made, Mike Joy. on it. We're going to check with Paul Andrews in a minute here when he comes back into the pit and see if they change the stagger relationship with the circumference on the tires. But there too, uh, they didn't twist the bolt. And I imagine the wiki running so well to try to get exactly the same setup on the car that they had for that last long run of green flag racing. Go back upstairs. I think we're about a lap away, two laps away from cutting them off again, sending them back under green in the caution period. And there was something that was bothering those cars up in four and getting them loose. They had the speed right crew out trying to rectify that situation. Things are like what one to go. Things are like what Walter said after the, at the 500. The old guys don't use as much gas as those young guys. They don't push the pedal as hard. <laughs> Darryl, and you know, to a degree, that was true. He didn't push the pedal. Oh, no, and he drafted well and everything. Darrell Walter just this past week visited with... Uh, the president, the first lady in Washington, D.C., and uh, he, he said in the driver's meeting, you just cannot believe 
how what a real person President Bush is. He said it felt like being home with your family, missing his friends were there with him, and uh, he said it was awesome. Uh, he had never been treated like that by someone so important. Only Daryl Waltrip after the race last week in Atlanta, Georgia, when Dixon Lane was saying something like, and George, I'll see you in Washington on Thursday. <laughs> Said he was great. He loved it. Pace car is coming in. I understand Mrs. Bush is very gracious. Oh, yeah. Follows the races here. Yeah. Here we go. Down for a start. Getting ready to finish it up. In the Pontiac Excitement 400. Alan Kowicki leads the way. Wallace is second across the line. Earnhardt breaks the inside net. Black number three in third. Ricky Rudd having trouble coming to speed. Rudd falling back on the start. Six, seven, eight, ten car length. Now he's at speed. Harry Gant stopped almost on that. He's coasting down the back stretch very slowly. I don't know if he's lost something in his transmission, but he's going down the back stretch slowly. 7 and 33 had hit each other under yellow, under the caution as it came around, and something is amiss on Gant's car. It's back on pit road. Meanwhile, up in front, Alan Kowicki. Here comes the battle for that front running position. Well, there's the hit down there in the back straightaway. Great battle for first place. On the outside, Rusty Wallace going for it. That was a hard hit between Alan Kowicki and Harry Gant, and I wonder if it has upset this car number seven a bit. Here's the 27 on the outside. Wallace trying to persevere. The Pontiac Excitement 400, if Wallace can win it, they might give him a new car. Here he is in the back straightaway. Rusty Wallace up in front. Kowicki to second. Earnhardt by third, and Earnhardt has yet to play his card. But well, he's coming hard, and he's just going to watch and let these two guys play it out and hope he can stay close enough to take advantage. Kowicki back on the inside, dives underneath Wallace as we get down to the side. It's a Ford on the inside, Pontiac on the outside, Chevy in third, Buick lies for it. Back straight away, wheel to wheel, outside, rim ride, it's Wallace. Back comes Kowicki on the inside. Everybody on their feet as we get down to the side this one. Dandy race. Wallace is going to switch through as he throws the dummy. He goes to the inside. Look at that move by Rusty Wallace. He fits to the outside in one like he was on a quarter mile track and then dove to the bottom. And here comes the man in black. Car number three, Dale Earnhardt. Can really do some short track driving. If there's anything left in that car, it's about time for him to explore those front two positions. Wallace to the wall. Kowicki stays with him. Earnhardt just waits his time. That was a big league stock car racing move Wallace put on, and I think that took just a little bit out of the number seven car driven by Alan Kowicki. So, uh, but Alan's car seems like it's stronger, and uh, he's just going to have to fight and Rudd continues to fall back. Something is amiss in the final moments on Ricky Rudd's car in fourth place. Harry Gant has just passed him up. Down into turn three, there is something really amiss for the Kenny Bernstein team at this point. They have now fallen 20 car lengths behind the number three car that is running third. The story is up in front. There lies Rusty Wallace in that lead. Alan Kowicki in second. And what a performance these two have put on for this gigantic congregation in Richmond, Virginia, as you watch it live on the Superstation this afternoon. Here on TBS, they come, home of the NBA, back to the strike, 376 to 400 complete. Lester Wallace trying to win it. He feels Richmond owes him one. He feels he lost the Winston Cup championship on this track last year after that altercation with Jeff Bodine. Alan Kowicki, who came here for two long, hard, depressing years. Crashing in practice the first year. Here's Kowicki, building up for another try on the inside. He keeps pushing down to that bottom there, and he keeps working the groove a little higher. Wallace not giving an edge. So similar to how they ran for years out in the Midwest, what we're seeing here right now. Don't forget to back in fifth. The lap down is Larry Pearson. Dick Trickle stays six. Three seventh is Davey Allison, eighth is Waltrip, ninth is Gant. Tenth, two laps down, Ernie Urban is having a great day. We do it again. Coming up. Oh, oh. sideways almost. That was close. And that's a good drive. Whoa, car in the wall. It looks like Triple has slammed the wall in turn two. Ooh, oh, just Rick. getting through with Rick Wilson. Caution is out. 
now you really do have a sprint to the finish here at Richmond today to top off your Pontiac Excitement 400. They'll gather their forces one more time. It may be an opportunity for Ricky Rudd, or it may be academic. There may be something more seriously wrong with that car. And you know, Kawicki had fought the battle, fought the battle, finally got by, and I think he was ready to drive off, and he gets another caution. Now he's going to have to refight that struggle, and he's got to try to beat these two guys out of the pits. And Earnhardt and Walter Wallace have two of the best teams in racing pit crew. All four leaders in that lead lap pull on to pit road. Rudd is in, Kowicki is in, Earnhardt is in, let's do all. So we're building for another dramatic Winston Cup finish, and you'll see it here on the Superstation in just a matter of moments. We're back at Richmond Fairgrounds Raceway, 18 laps to go. Harold Elliott, team manager for Rusty Wallace. What's it feel like to stand here and watch your driver lose the lead in turn one and get it back in turn two? I don't really care to watch it. <laughs> My, he's doing a good job. Allen's doing a good job. You know, the two's been doing some clean racing. and they got Earnhardt back there. And uh, I tell you, I know he's just waiting on a chance for either one of them to, to miss a beat. And we're going racing. We're going back to green. 18 laps to go. Wallace in front. Earnhardt second. Kowicki in third. But here's the skinny on Kowicki. He is saying on the scanner that the race is going to come back to him, John. Well, the race might come back to him and all that sort of thing. Man, I'd hate to have to go by those two guys in front of him because there, there could be a little mirror driving in this deal. Now, I'd never see those two guys up front looking in the mirror, but I would assume uh, they might be, that might be the most important part of their race car right now. I hope you don't hit the right hand with either of them. Here's Wallace up in front, Earnhardt in second. A battle of two great intimidators. Both of them are brave. Both of them have great confidence in their skills as drivers. Alan Kowicki so poised and cool line third. And the Ricky Rudd car is seen a little better than it did before, although he has three lap cars between himself and those three leaders. Kowicki, who suffered so much frustration, is going after Earnhardt. Lap trickling away, and Earnhardt is being challenged on the inside, and Kowicki stays right there with him. He noses the Ford down on the inside of the Chevrolet the frustration and dejection of two years ago being replaced by confidence and determination and Kowicki is going to second well I guess if you can drive around Dale Earnhardt maybe uh, getting around Rusty Wallace ought to be a piece of cake <laughs> obviously Kowicki being the engineer that he is knows something the rest of us don't the race is coming his way Earnhardt remember has struggled the whole second half of the race trying to get the right tires to make the car work that's a good year team they don't run Hoosier a lot perhaps that's part of the problem Wallace, on the other hand, has been a lap and a half down, now has the advantage over Kowicki. I think he's going to be a little tougher to catch than was Earnhardt. Well, I think uh, I was really proud of Dale Earnhardt, but, you know, Allen obviously had a better car, and Dale basically pulled over and let him go by, and he could have used the racetrack up for a long time. I think that's a real sure sportsman. 388 down of 400, and you see the interval between first and second, the issue. Can the Ford overhaul the Pontiac as it did the Chevrolet? Wallace really setting sail here in the last lap. Let's get some times on him. With new rubber on, he's running as fast as anything we've seen in the entire distance here in the last moment on a slippery, greasy three-quarter mile, 14-degree banking in the turn. Yeah, indeed, Ken, we show a 115 and three-quarter mile per hour lap on Wallace, 23.32 the lap. Now's when it counts, and he uncorked a good one by our tally. That's the fastest lap of the race. Maybe we should have had the watch on Colwick. It looks like he might have picked up a couple of lines or a couple of car lines that lap. Best finish for Rusty Wallace ever in this race, third, 1987, working on a win. 116.1, David, you better... Get those uh, computers ready to give to the Rusty Wallace team. 116-1. That looks for us like the quickest thing that's happened today. Back comes Wallace another time. 390. 10 to go. Advantage, 12 car length. Kowicki trying hard to collect him back up. And he is gaining. He is picking up a little ground. I don't think it's enough. Well, Rusty Wallace has one of the best tire men in the business, if not the best, Todd Parrott. And uh, he's the son of a great crew chief, Buddy Parrott. Buddy Parrott. But uh, they stock the, and they live with those tires. And I think they change the tire stagger a little bit. And the car seems to be working better for Rusty now. 
winner of 11 Winston Cup races, Rusty Wallace, going for a big number 12. And he has said that this race at Richmond, he felt, would tell the story on the rest of the year. He said a good race here, give him a leg up on the championship. Mentioned that in the press. Here he is doing just that, but that lead is being trimmed. Seven laps to go. Seven remaining. It's going to be a shootout. Getting around is going to be the key thing, but uh, Allen is definitely catching it. Here we are in the back straightaway. There's your first place car. And there you see that second place car staying right with him. If this race is won by Wallace, he better put that trophy up in the little pieces and give it to that pit crew. That's one good thing I admire and respect about Rusty Wallace. He gives all the credit to his pit crew, and uh, that's why they're so close, and that's why they're so tough to beat. They are a team. Back in fifth is Allison. Sixth is Pearson. Seventh is Darrell Walcott. Two laps back is Harry Gannon. Eighth, Ernie Urban is ninth. Shirley Marlin, tenth. Michael Waltrip is eleventh. Three laps down. And Lake Peters in twelfth. Bill Elliott sustaining thirteenth. Mark Martin, fourteenth. Rick Mann, four laps down in fifteenth. You can, see, running up. you can see Allen's driving the car harder and harder. It, the rear end was shaking a little bit. What's happening? He's driving in deeper and deeper, and he is gaining on Rusty. You see it quiver in turn one. The car just shakes in the back a little bit. That means he drove it in just as hard and as far as he could, because he knows this is the time to do it. Wallace came in here really pumped for this race. He thought that he had a lot to prove. He thought that he had a lot at stake here and he's driving it just that way. Lost last year's Winston Cup to Bill Elliott by just 24 points. And he admits he doesn't have a lot of laps here at Richmond. In fact, since he has said, I've got one lap at speed on this new track, and at that place since they rebuild it, and that's all. And that's because of that crash that he had last September with Jeff O'Donnell. Coming up this time. I believe they're going to be staying through the time. Two laps to go this time by. It was three. Now they win to two. And definitely closing down is Kulwick. White flat. One lap to go. One to go. Oh, had it been two. Here's Kulwick. still making up ground. Still closing. Out of turn two into the back straightaway. Five car length advantage belongs to Wallace. Here comes Kulwick. charging at the end. He caught, picked up three car lengths down the straightaway in the backside. But at the line, Rusty Wallace records his second victory of 1989. That is his 12th Winston Cup victory. The margin, 49, one hundredths of a second. 19 lead changes among seven drivers. 12 caution, 67 laps under caution. And the Pontiac Excitement 400 is won by a Pontiac. Taking the extra lap, car number 27. Rusty Wallace has won here at the Richmond International Raceway. After 12 caution periods, he is going to pull into victory lane and will be there to meet him after these messages. Stay tuned. Let's meet the winner. Of the Pontiac Excitement 400, Rusty Wallace, Chris Economaki is standing by. Hey, Rusty, congratulations. How much time did you spend looking in the mirror there the last part of the race? Oh, about the last 15 laps. Alan was quicker. I mean, he had a good car. It's just that the Bale Ma Blue Max guys bailed me out one more time, had a qu quick stop. We were able to run quick all day long, but uh, Alan really was faster at the end. I'd like to congratulate him. And I'll tell you, the Pontiac, it run great today. Kodiak, Mobile One, AC Spark was all the sponsors. And I'll tell you, that crew, they're pretty sharp again. Couldn't have been too tough a race, Rusty. You got all this wind for the commercials and everything. What about when that wheel nut didn't work and they flagged you back in? What was on your mind then? Well, I just, uh, I felt the vibration in the impact wrench uh, on the right front wheel lost all its torque. It just wouldn't tighten the lug, nut, the lug nuts up. And we had to come in. I felt the vibrate, and I didn't want to take a chance of tearing the car up. I see some marks on the side of your car here, Rusty. Uh, souvenirs are from whom? Oh, just a little bit of everybody, I guess, out there, Chris. Uh, you know, it was a pretty tough race today. It was a real clean race for me. Uh, but a little bit of Dale Earnhardt, a little bit of Alan Quick, a little bit of everybody, and a bunch of tough customers out there. Okay, how are you going to celebrate, Rusty? 
I'll take all these guys out for a party and get home with my wife, Patty, right now. I haven't seen her in a while, and I want to get home. Well, good. Congratulations and good luck. Yeah, let's go down out of Mike Joy with Alan Kowicki. Well, Alan's back here near the truck of the T-Rex Ford. And, gosh, Alan, I know it's got to be a tough one to lose by just a car length or so, but as well as you ran today, you've got to be fairly happy with that. Well, I don't know. I, I used to be happy with second place. You know, that used to be a good run for us, but we had this race won, and it's this time to finish second is a little frustrating, you know, but uh, we did the best we could. The brakes just didn't go our way, and we kept having those darn caution flags again, and we're, you know, normally these races run a long stretch of green, and that's the way we're set up to run, and uh, the brakes just didn't go our way today. A tough break for the man who finished second. We'll be back to Richmond Fairgrounds Raceway right after this. 